Uh, Banner is a little over 75 years old. Um, we began our uh, celebration uh, a year or two ago. Um, as the name applies, uh, Ag Agriculture and Natural Resources, that it's quite broad. Uh, we cover really food, agriculture, production systems, um, but we also uh, cover this, the natural resources, so soil, water, forestry. So it's quite diverse committee. Uh, I, it's a joy to work uh, because it is so diverse and there's so many synergies and sometimes conflict uh, between uh, topics. Uh, we've, for those that aren't aware uh, and listening or Zoom and that, uh, we've had several reports. You can go online and look at those, but we've had these webinars that we've done the last couple of years on different topics from uh, ag production systems to robotics, uh, soil, water. Um, and then we had an earlier session last year uh, on uh, labor. And now we're having this workshop webinar this morning, again, on the issue of um, labor and automation <clears throat> and how it affects um, sustainability, social sustainability of our food uh, ag systems. And that became apparent uh, two years ago when COVID hit and there was disruption in the supply chains uh, and particularly the, the animal industry, meat industry, um, uh, as well as some of the vegetable production systems. So this is an extremely important topic uh, and it, it really play, uh, uh, holds well within our purview of the National Academy. Um, so I guess I'm supposed to introduce the administrators. Um, Kurt, where you go? Oh, there you go. So uh, it was actually a joy to be back here because there's some colleagues I've known for um, some cases, 20 years. Um, so uh, you're going to hear from um, President uh, Kirk Schultz, who is uh, from our uh, president of Washington State University, who was my president at Kansas State University um, a few years ago. Uh, and we've connected a few times and uh, we follow each other. Uh, and then um, Dr. Wendy Powers is the new. I guess you can still say that it's two weeks or so, uh, Dean of the College of Agriculture. Uh, and I've known her uh, again about 20 years. We're on a, a national air quality task force. Uh, she was at Iowa State University and Michigan State University, um, which I came from Michigan State. So we've had several kind of connections there. You were at UC Davis? The system. System, okay, uh, before. Uh, coming here at Washington State. So she'll make some comments. And then Chris Keene, I don't know you, <laughs> um, but he's the VPR, Vice Provost for Research uh, at in the Washington State University system. So they're going to have uh, opening remarks. So uh, Kirk, you want to, are you leading? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. It's great to see uh, so many of the board members that were there last night. I had the opportunity, thanks, Jill, to have dinner, and it's great to see some of our WSU colleagues and others from around the country. Um, you're on one of the five physical campuses of Washington State University. We are uh, spread throughout the state of Washington. Our historic flagship campus is in Pullman. Uh, we're here in the Tri-Cities, and this has an interesting history in itself that was really set up as a graduate center cooperatively between the University of Washington, Oregon State University, and Washington State University. So I showed a couple people walking in, but yeah, out in the hallway, if you look to the right by where the trash cans are, there was a graphic artist that decided that this needed a mascot here. So he combined a beaver, Oregon State, a husky for UW, and a cougar for WSU into one animal. So it looks a little odd, but uh, that never quite caught on, but it's an interesting interesting piece of art. Um, we also have a campus in Spokane, Washington, where our health sciences are centered. We started a medical school at, during uh, my first year or so uh, that was a passion project for President Elson Floyd before he passed away. We've now graduated several 
uh, uh, years of medical students. And that's been an interesting challenge that's best told over a glass of wine, getting that up and going and things like that. But that's really the center of our health sciences. So nursing, pharmacy, and medicine is uh, in Spokane. Our newest campus uh, is in Everett, Washington. Uh, and that was started about seven, eight years ago. And that was really to serve the uh, manufacturing STEM related uh, industry in Boeing in particular. Uh, and then we have a campus in Vancouver, Washington uh, that really uh, works in the Portland, Vancouver area. Um, so we uh, were excited to, to be here to serve as Washington's land grant university. And we certainly welcome all of you today. So I was thinking over just a couple things to talk about this morning. I thought about some of the challenges that we have ahead of us, uh, particularly as land grant universities. And I really have three things that I think are important that, that are relevant, I think, to some of the discussions you have uh, today. Uh, I think one thing that's incumbent upon land grants is really bridging and leading the bridging of the urban rural divide. Uh, we see it in legislatures across the country. Uh, we see it in a lot of the communities that as land grant universities, we have supported for decades uh, how this, this seeming divide has occurred. Uh, we like to talk about all these stories uh, when I'm in Washington of you know, folks that have spent uh, a bunch of years in Seattle. And I was at an event recently, uh, talked to this uh, particular person, been in Seattle 10 years. And I said, uh, have you ever been to Eastern Washington? He said, oh yes, I've been. I've been to Clay Ellum. For those of you in Washington, <laughs> you realize that's just on the opposite side of the mountain, uh, right before you've really seen two thirds or three quarters of the state. Uh, I say that because sometimes in the urban settings, people have a really stilted view of what life is like in these rural areas. And I think it's up to us, it's up to land grant presidents to help lead the way. The second is, we talked a lot last night just at our end of the table around enrollment and enrollment challenges in traditional agricultural programs. And I think that's something that we're seeing at a lot of universities. And that's certainly a challenge and something that I think all of us will work to address. And I think the other part of this is not just enrollment overall, but how are we making sure that we are uh, attracting first generation and students of color into some of these programs that traditionally maybe have not been where a lot of those enrollments are. So um, I think those are all things, and these are not you know, for somebody else to figure out, it's all of us working together. And as the leaders uh, around the country and thinking about uh, agricultural issues, policy issues, the land grant universities, I think this is something that I certainly encourage all of you to, to spend some time on. Well, it's also some opportunities for us. And I think I look upon these as positives moving ahead. First, land grant universities are uniquely positioned because we have extension. Um, and I can tell you, my colleagues at the University of Washington would love to have a presence in every county in the state of Washington. And the same applies regardless of where you are. That is a strength that land grant universities offer. One of the interesting things I remember when I was in Kansas is we'd be out talking to people and they would talk about their you know, extension agent and that, that thing there, and sometimes didn't even associate it with the university. We need to make sure that people understand that Washington State is out there. Your particular universities are out there in these rural areas uh, making a difference and in the urban areas making a difference as well. Um, the second is, I think there is a outstanding interest in food. Uh, people are interested in food and where it comes from and we, seem, we need to translate that interest in where I go to eat, where I get my produce, where I get all this stuff with an interest. If you're interested in that, you should go to a land grant university. You should be in agriculture. That's where you're gonna learn how to do uh, a lot of this well and, and to really take that interest and take it to the next level. Um, I'd never heard of the term farm to table until a couple of years ago uh, that now is this really popular term, certainly on the West Coast, and I think this is our opportunity to capitalize on that. Interestingly, so many of the farm to table places I wind up going, restaurants, things like that, I will always meet some alumni there. It's interesting the number of Washington State University that, uh, folks that are involved in the wine part, uh, where people source their food, uh, the, the hospitality beverage combination, 
all of those kind of things. It turns out many, many times we've got our alumni there. So how do we take people coming into a restaurant that want to do farm to table and say, you need to be involved more strategically in agriculture in our state. And then finally, I think, and we talked about this at the end of the table quite a bit last night, um, I think it's incumbent upon us as leaders to bridge some of the political divides. Uh, one of our challenges in the state of Washington is we are a very blue state with very blue politics, except for certain areas that tend to be more red. How do we make sure that we've got both sides of the aisle supporting agriculture and supporting production agriculture? I'll talk with folks that maybe lean a little left and some of their uh, ideas about agriculture, where they get their information. You just say, hey, we need to kind of work on this a little bit. And we need some people on both sides of that aisle bridging that gap and supporting really our ability to produce safe food uh, for the world from the United States. So uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I lo love dinner. It's great to uh, catch back up with Chuck a little bit after spending seven years working together at K-State. And I just also want to thank Jill for her leadership and pulling all this together. Uh, those of you who've ever been a department chair, school director, know that you don't have anything to do. You just kind of sit around looking for projects. So just a round of applause for Jill and her work. Thank you. With that, I took up all the time for welcoming remarks. So my colleagues have nothing to say anyway. So I don't know who's next, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kirk, for that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Great to see you. I'm Chris Keene, Vice President for Research at WSU, and also I'm Vice Chancellor for Research at our Pullman campus. Uh, I'm a physicist by background, uh, worked in plasma physics, uh, fusion energy, national security at Lawrence Livermore. So, Wendy, we you know, have the, we're just talking about our experiences with the UC system. Of course, I have that. So, anyway, it's great to be here and welcome you. So, Kirk gave you a little overview of some of the campuses, also, to do a research oriented tour. I'll just make a few remarks about that. So first, you know, starting here in Tri-Cities, you know, this is one of WSU six campuses, about 1,600 students, you know, and the student body here is about 35% Hispanic and 44% first gen. And that kind of really demonstrates our commitment to serving the students of all backgrounds here at WSU, right? It's really part of our land grant mission, you know, that uh, Kirk alluded to. And Tri-Cities plays a very important role in our research enterprise as well. It's home to one of our three institutes with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, the Bioproducts Institute. There's a major facility here. <clears throat> we also have two other institutes with PNNL and GRID and Nuclear Science, as well as a graduate degree program, which now has over 40 students and alumni. And we have 50 joint appointees with the lab. That, that is actually their largest number. We're their largest research partner. So a lot of research going on here. This is also, an emerging focus area for energy systems work here. You may have heard about there's going to be two small modular nuclear reactors going in over the next five to closer to 10, most likely, over at the Hanford site. And there's also the new scale system, which is also going on over at Idaho. So a lot of work here in energy. Very exciting. Um, so you know, moving around the clock, if you will, if you go to Vancouver, Kirk mentioned, that's actually also a very research active campus and is growing. There's some great work there in neuroscience, a coastal ecology, you might imagine, be, imagine being near the coast. And there's a brand new life sciences building going in there, which will really multiply the opportunities at, at that campus. Then you come to Spokane, which Kirk already alluded to, the new med school there. Um, about 1,500 students there all together as well. Um, the, the, the colleges of medicine, pharma, pharmacy, and nursing there together compose about you know, 15, 15 to 18% of our $280 million a year in awards, right? So that gives you a sense of the scale of both that campus you know, with respect to uh, the entire system. Um, so then we come down, down to the, the flagship campus of Pullman continuing around the clock, right? About 20,000 students. That's where the, the bulk of our enterprise is. Um, and the, our enterprise is about $360 million a year research, research expenditures. I'll talk about that. We have numerous centers of excellence in there. And they range from this thing called the Institute of Shock Physics, near and dear to my heart as a physicist. But it is actually probably the, the, the world's leading university center in the study of matter at ultra high pressures, millions of atmospheres pressure where you know, phases change and you know, basically have no understanding of material at those conditions. For example, at the center of Earth core, that's about 4 million atmospheres and we really don't have very little understanding at all 
of what the iron core there is actually like. So that's that study at WSU. So we do research from that, also ranging to things like digital humanities, right? We're, we have a very active program in digital humanities, both the curation and study of these artifacts, which are essentially we record them digitally, make them broadly available for study, and thereby really increase, really increase the scholarly activity in this area. Um, so you know that's a that's an ultra quick tour. Um, as I said earlier, our expenditures are about three hundred and sixty million dollars a year. That's sort of top eleven percent in in the U.S. by the HERB rankings that you all know. But also, um, it's it, it would be number one in twenty five states. Actually, uh, we we have a very large other research university in this state, which Kirk talked about. So, uh, but we we also we actually do work quite closely together. I speak regularly with my colleague at the U University of Washington dealing with things like right now, research security, things of that sort, which are always in the news and as part of the, you know, part of the life of the feedback because we don't have enough projects either, Kurt, just, just in case you're looking for some help. Um, anyway, um, I'd just like to thank you all again for attending. Really look forward to hearing the talks today on this really important subject. And I also just like to close by acknowledging the recent induction of two of our faculty into the academy, uh, John Browse from the Institute of Biological, uh, Wendy will talk more about this, uh, John Browse from Biolog Biological Chemistry and Tim Kohler in Anthropology. I didn't say much, Wendy, about Connors because I, I knew you would cover our largest research unit. Okay, so thank you all. Well, good morning. I'm Wendy Powers. Uh, as Kirk mentioned, I am, I've finished my third week on the job as the new Dean of the College of Agricultural, Human and Natural Resource Sciences. And uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about Connors and I, and I know Chris uh, touched on a couple of things. I will say, I'm really glad Chris didn't go any deeper into physics because he was already losing me when we were talking about four atmospheres. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I want to share a little bit about uh, Connors and some of the things that really drew me to Washington State. Uh, Connors, or the college, uh, has one of the largest presences of the entire WSU system, with faculty distributed on all the campuses that Chris talked about and Kirk mentioned as well. Uh, the faculty uh, support 13 schools and departments, uh, three extension program units, four research and extension centers, and I know you're going to get a chance to visit one of them tomorrow, I believe, during the tour. Um, and as Kirk mentioned, we've got an extension presence in 39 counties. One thing that was new for me that I haven't experienced in my other institutions is that we also have an extension presence on the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. And so I'm really excited to see what that program looks like uh, and, and how we can build those programs across the state. Um, the scale of Connors and its impact is really reflected in the academic programs. Within Connors, we offer 22 majors, 19 minors, and 27 graduate programs. And as I've started to look at the curriculum of those programs, one of the things that's really struck me is how transdisciplinary those programs are, uh, really trying to turn out students who can engage in the 21st century global challenges. So it's exciting to see that approach to education and I'm so excited to be part of WSU taking that approach. Um, as we develop those educational programs, we really are building the next generation of leaders in everything that ranges from animal science to food science, apparel and natural resources. All of that is residing within the college. Uh, and we're also uh, leaders across the country. Uh, Chris mentioned uh, we've got National Academy members, four of them are affiliated with Connors. We also have uh, 19 Washington State uh, Academy of Science members, um, 13 regions professors, and over 20 statewide supported endowed professors and distinguished professors. And so tremendous support from the agricultural sector in delivering the mission, the land grant mission across Washington. I think Connors can really be of tremendous assistance to Banner members and the world at large as we really start tackling some of those challenges related to agriculture, economics, and human development. And so I would encourage you to take a look at some of our programs as you're, after you have seen some of the tours tomorrow and really think about how we can connect with Connors and the board and its work. In particular, there's uh, three, sub 
centers that I want to draw attention to. Within Connors, we lead 18 subject matter centers. Uh, the three I want to draw attention to first is Bioproduct Sciences and Engineering Lab, uh, a tremendous facility and resource to Connors and to WSU as a whole. The second is the Center for Precision Automated Ag Systems, and I think you'll see some of that work tomorrow as you're touring over at Prosser. And then the final one is Center for Sustaining Ag and Natural Resources. So again, on your plane ride home, I, I'd really encourage you to take a look at some of those uh, centers and, and think about how we can partner. Because Connors and, and WSU really does support a sustainable future. Um, and it does so by that powerful combination of discovery and translational research to address all things related to the 21st, global, 21st century global challenges. We're doing that not just here locally or here in the state of Washington, but nationally and globally as well. And so we encourage you to really think about partnering with us uh, in the future and uh, think how we can help serve the board and your work. So with that, I'm going to close. I know we're probably a little bit behind time. And uh, I really want to welcome you all here. I hope you have a wonderful time. I hope you see lots of things that get your creative juices flowing. and. We, we left the weather warm for you, just in case you like it 100 <laughs>
So that was more important than, than going to school for some days uh, during, during months. As I moved to uh, my university in Kathmandu, a college in Kathmandu University in Thailand, and then my um, uh, PhD at Iowa State University, I was involved in agriculture one way or the other. I learned a lot of things around computer science, automation control, but then all the times I was kind of using that knowledge around agriculture to, to develop some technologies. Um, I started to learn more and more about agriculture, particularly at the West, the larger scale, bigger machines. I was working in automating or improving the auto guidance system for this kind of tractor and implement system at Iowa State University for my PhD. A lot of things were mechanized or automated. Um, nobody would be taking um, animals to plow fields and, and, and turn them behind. So it was much better environment. I was inside the cab, running my computer, trying to make sure this tractor follows a certain path, but that was much, much easier than uh, harvesting a petty rice manually. But then as I moved further to Pacific Northwest some 12 years ago, now I started to realize, well, not really, things are still pretty much the same. The way I used to harvest oranges is not much different than how we are harvesting apples at Washington, uh, at Washington State and, and, and many, in Washington State and many other uh, parts of the world. And this is a really difficult um, physically challenging, but also sometimes dangerous job. Like there are a lot of reports around ladder pills, sometimes death. And it also exposes to really harsh environmental conditions like really hot summer, really cold winters, and sometimes even um, wildfire smokes that are uh, at a toxic level and exposure to chemicals and other things. And that's why I think at this stage with all the advancement in artificial intelligence, robotic technologies, Many other supporting technologies as a sensor, data, data analytics, big data, internet of things. I think we are in the point that we must do better than what we're doing in solving some of the challenges to use machines to do the, the, the hard job and allow human workers to do more of a management operation and those kinds of it's also certainly linked to what Jill mentioned about availability and cost of labor, because we always are facing decreasing availability and increasing cost of labor, and certainly that's not going to be sustainable. And that's why some 10, 12 years ago, I started working in developing robotic solutions. Uh, my program is in very close partnership with Dr. Tsinzang, who is sitting behind here, uh, developing robotic or automated solutions for different kinds of applications, particularly focusing on harvesting. Certainly there has been long research and development. It's not just me coming here and starting developing robot to pick apples. There are a lot of uh, researchers around the world developing many different kinds of robotic solutions for harvesting, pruning, painting, other applications in the specialty crops particularly, but it's still limited commercial success, I would say. And there are a couple of major reasons why we have not been able to successfully commercialize these machines. This includes the speed, accuracy, robustness, or their lack of those qualities in these machines. Produce plant damage, certain technologies such as second cast apple harvesting, for example, and cost and lack of adoption that cycle because it's a relatively small market, technologies are more expensive, uh, small market meaning production cost is larger, and certainly if it is more costly, farmers are not able to uh, adopt them, they're running in really thin margin, and that's kind of a cycle we need to break. To address the challenges, there are researchers around the world working and uh, developing various different kinds of different um, ways of, of harvesting um, specialty crops such as apples, cherries, pears, triple crops, and vegetable crops such as uh, this, this uh, um, papers here. A lot of universities in New Zealand, uh, Australia um, region, um, conversion from Mac to Windows is perhaps what is causing some of this. Uh, pardon about that. Pardon me on that. But <clears throat> and then in Europe, there are uh, a lot of projects there, and there are projects in China and other parts of the world as well that I'm not including everything. 
But along the MISCs, we at Washington State University have also prioritized this, this particular area a lot and we have uh, developed very innovative solutions uh, to perform a lot of these field operations. Um, and in the next uh, couple of slides, we'll be <clears throat> just, just going through those. <clears throat> At Washington Station for Precision and Automated Agricultural Systems, we're particularly focusing on apple and cherry harvesting technologies. We're using both what we call robotic pick and, pick and place kind of technologies. But at the same time, we're also looking at alternative ways of harvesting that involves what we call targeted second catch kind of technologies. We'll see some of the, the videos later if it runs the window machine. <clears throat> and then within that, the scope of this pick and place and uh, mass harvesting or second cascade of harvesting systems, we're looking at various different innovative ways of uh, using cameras and using artificial intelligence techniques to locate, detect and locate where the, the fruit is, avoid obstacles and, and integrate various uh, robotic components together into a robotic system. And also in the second cats uh, area, we're looking at various ways to save trees and various different kinds of mechanisms to catch fruit right underneath where they are so that we can keep the, the uh, damage at, at a minimum level. Here is an example of automated cherry harvesting work we did a few years ago now. Um, and we started with a big machine that could sick, grab and sick uh, cherry tree trunks, but then we, um, applied uh, a really optimized second signal and also aided cameras, both daytime and nighttime capabilities to take images, find where branches are. And we're looking at the ways to go, actually go to those branches or trunks automatically, grab them automatically and suck them uh, automatically. We then also have been working in robotic apple harvesting for quite some years now. Um, we first try to understand how human pickers pick these apples using different kinds of sensors in our fingers, what kind of uh, force or pressure is involved, what kind of motion is involved, what kind of torque is involved, and what keeps the fruit is still safe while it is being uh, picked um, and detached from the branches. We then develop a robotic hand, or what we also call in effectors that are um, very gentle and can do the job without damaging fruit. And that we also use different kinds of cameras, uh, color as well as positioning or 3D information that we would go together into detecting these apples uh, using deep learning uh, techniques, artificial one, one of the artificial intelligence techniques and integrate all of that together into a robotic system that looks something like this, different versions, of the prototypes that we can see in this video. So timeline-wise, <clears throat> I think this first prototype was built in about, uh, built uh, in maybe roughly 2015, 16 timeframe. And then we kind of continued to improve the prototype over time. You can see uh, in the next second or so, a newer version, I guess. And this one, we tried kind of synchronize two kind of robots. One is picking, another is catching. And third robot behind there, if you can see who is moving the fruit away. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> He is currently developing a robotic strawberry harvesting down in Florida. So uh, he's not the robot, but a roboticist. <laughs> Once we kind of knew what we could do, uh, demonstrate the prototype, we started from, uh, uh, collaborating with this company called FF Robotics. We wrote proposals together to bring the technology to the next level, uh, bring it to a full scale uh, machine, as you can see here. Uh, six arms in the left, left side, six on the right side, a full 12 arm full scale machine with a certain with different kinds of arms, linear, uh, different kinds of hands, uh, yeah. similar technologies in terms of artificial intelligence that goes behind it. And this company 
um, has been developing and testing businesses now in Washington. As we speak, my students are in the field, are supporting the, the field work, all of that. But anyway, uh, you can see here in this video that this is, a, a, in my opinion, one of the most advanced robotic solutions for picking fruit in the world. Um, I'll show a couple of other examples in a little bit uh, from other companies, um, but because I work with this company, I have that privilege, I think, to say that this is one of the really best ones. <laughs> but I think more seriously, we have made a lot of progresses in picking fruit and getting it to commercialize us. And I think we are really close to, to pick apples commercially. Or maybe Apple Robotics is already providing very small scale service this year um, down the road. Uh, we still have about two months left roughly of the harvesting season. In addition to, as I said, pick and place, one foot at a time technology, we also have been advancing what we call targeted second cast harvesting system. It requires certain kind of training. And we have been looking at different mechanisms for seeking that optimizes the force and the type of signal we apply, um, how fast and how far, that kind of uh, thing. And then different kinds of catching mechanisms, uh, how far from the fruit and what kind of material that would go onto those catching surfaces. And all of that put together is a targeted second cat harvesting system that we've tested in many different kinds of, uh, uh, many different varieties of apples. It certainly works for some varieties and it's not for all kinds of apples that we produce. We can see in this video how it functions. Currently you see only three layers of catchers and there is one machine in the other side that can close the canopy so that the fruit would not fall outside of these catchers. And the goal to have six or seven layers so that the fruit would not have to drop very far from where they are. Right now, just for testing, we have two or three layers. And you can see between those two layers, there is not much different. Uh, the, the depth is certainly like about 18 inches or so. The fruit are always falling within a foot or so. And that is really, keeping the um, quality uh, at, a, at a, in my opinion, uh, close to acceptable level. It's about 10% for some varieties right now, 10% um, bruising at cuts, and for others, it's still relatively higher. But also, as I mentioned earlier, for example, Gala, you keep shaking and they don't want to fall off, versus there are other like uh, Envy and Jazz, they are relatively easy to, to remove from the tree with this kind of shaking and also keep the quality at acceptable level or close to acceptable at this time and we're continuing to advance. So that's another alternative approach. And I'm thinking these are not competitive technologies. Picking, placing with robot versus this kind of targeted second cat, they are suitable in certain situations, certain uh, crop varieties. And I think they can go in a complementary way in the future. We're also developing robotic solutions for strawberry harvesting. Um, in collaboration with some of the other researchers from uh, uh, other states, as you can see here. The goal here is to have relatively smaller modular machines that would pick and, 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 and fill a bucket uh, or even carry those buckets outside of the field. But rather than having a big machine, we'd like to have relatively small machines and um, have them work together. This is being tested in Florida as we speak, and we're providing artificial intelligence and other supports for this machine to work and, and um, to continuing to advance and improve this technology and um, potentially commercialize in the future. Now, going more towards what to do after we have those fruit harvested and, and those beans and containers filled. Uh, this is the project led by Dr. Chin Wang, again, sitting behind there in the audience. Um, we have been working, our center have, has been working in this kind of what we call uh, uh, an automated bin handling system, also called bin dog, or something that follows us and does the thing for us. Um, here is a, an empty bin that would otherwise be full if it was were a harvesting season. And then this robot would go grab it and pull it and bring it outside of the, the, the rows and 
and uh, help load them onto, onto drugs. These are research efforts <clears throat> at WSU um, and a few other examples from other uh, research programs around the world. But then in recent years, there have been a lot of interest from venture capitalists and <clears throat> private startups and even established bigger agricultural agri-tech companies to bring these kinds of robotic solutions into commercialization. For example, acquisition of Blue River technology by John Deere a couple of years ago for some $450 million or so. So as an example of the interest level, uh, I'm showing some YouTube videos of a couple of companies who are putting a lot of efforts in picking apples or other similarly uh, stepped and sized fruit crops around the world. Um, these are publicly available videos, so you can watch them in, in YouTube as well and just borrowing um, from a direct source, even though they're public, I was asking these, the uh, CEOs or the top level management of these companies that some, a video that they would like to share. One of these companies is called Robotics Plus out of New Zealand. Similar technologies in terms of vision system, the deep learning and all of that, but then uh, they're putting several robotic manipulators or arms and different kinds of hands together to pick TV. And I think they're also trying apple picking with kind of similar technology. Harvest Crew is a company down in Florida, as I mentioned earlier, one of my students is a leading um, a roboticist in this company right now, trying to develop and commercialize a robotic app, um, a strawberry picking machine. It's a big machine, a lot of uh, uh, arms and hands working simultaneously. And I think they're really close to uh, commercialize them. They may already be picking some um, fruit commercially as a service. Bond and Robotics is a company or was a company uh, focusing really heavily and picking fruit and they tested their machine a lot in the state of Washington in the last four or five years. And recently they uh, stopped working in this area and I think the IP has been acquired by another company and they're trying to revive this and, and continue to advance this technology. But uh, when it comes to apple picking, they mentioned earlier FF Robotics and the, this company uh, or this technology are the two that are most advanced and I think the closest uh, to commercialization. This is Devil Arab, Arabotics from Israel, a different mobility style for picking. And instead of ground robots, now we're using flying robots. Um, vision system, again, would stay pretty much the same, taking images, using deep learning, best uh, image processing finding where they are locating them. But then picking is being conducted with these kinds of um, flying robots. Not enough. What I mean by not enough is that, <clears throat> well, we're making a lot of progresses in, in robot picking. I think we're closer than ever uh, in solving my dream of reducing labor use in picking different kinds of fruits, really back looking work. You climb up and down the ladder with 40 pounds of fruit. Um, at this, in the state of Washington, we harvest some 18 billion apples a year. There is this 18 billion motions of human hand, a lot of um, repetitive motion kind of injury. We're getting closer to solve that, but that's not enough because how labor is used in, in orchard operations as you can see in the winter, we have pruning and simplifying it really heavily, but just provide some concept. A little bit after pruning is over, some overlap there, there is a kind of a narrower bell curve of, of thinning and uh, some other operations. When I say thinning, it is both power thinning and green fruit thinning. Labor use is maybe slightly uh, taller and narrower. Um, Jeff is here, I think he has better idea about this curve, but Jeff Cleveringa. Harvesting is the tallest one um, and it runs for about two to three months. With robotic picking technology, this tallest curve would go down. We may have maybe 20% of or maybe 10% of the labor for that particular 
uh, operation, but then other um, peaks are still there. So that's why it is not enough to just pick and we have to do other things so that we have a constant use or demand of labor throughout the growing season. And we have uh, a year long employment uh, for, for the seasonal uh, workers, uh, but at a lower um, level. And that's why at Washington State University, we're not only focusing on picking, but also creating canopies so that it could be robotic, uh, the, the canopies are ready for robotic picking one, but also minimize labor in training trees, uh, pruning branches, thinning flowers, thinning green fruits, and even pollinating these flowers such that we have only the right amount of fruit at the right location being pollinated and set leading to a completely autonomous operation in the future that allows fruit to grow in the best places that could be picked robotically uh, with high efficiency. And we're working in many very different aspects of these canopy and crop management technologies, but this past winter and spring, we were testing these machines first time in the field. And I would say with this kind of technology, this is first time around the world for something like what, what we're doing. Three different machines running here. Uh, I don't know if I'm kind of making you dizzy, uh, but similar mechanisms in terms of arm and hand, different brand, slightly different brand. Cameras are same, but the way images are analyzed are slightly different. In the sector or the hand is different between operations because for pruning, we have a cutting scissor, thinning, we have a brush. Um, for pollination, we have a spray nozzle. They share a lot of technologies, but there are certain differences. And this is the way we are trying to go, having all kinds of operations automated, but with a machine that could function uh, to perform multiple operations or a multi-purpose machine. And that's one way I think we could also improve the commercial viability of these machines. So with that, I'll take just another minute or two. Um, here, um, challenges and directions. We're making a lot of progresses in picking apples. As I said, we're closer than ever <clears throat> in making them commercially uh, viable. But it's still achieving really high efficiency is a huge challenge. Even for the modern orchards that we have in Washington and other parts of the world, I think we're roughly, with these kinds of machines that we saw, we're roughly picking around 65, maybe 70, at most maybe 75% of fruit. It's still uh, uh, 25, 20% of fruit behind branches or, or maybe they're growing in a cluster. It's very difficult for these robots to pick. So there needs to be some human robot collaboration uh, to make sure it works um, in the, at least in the starting. Conventional orchards, I don't think these machines are very good yet because of these bushy, bigger canopies, fruit being inside, it's not easy to go get them um, at least uh, at a reasonable speed and cost. We still face challenges with the speed, complexity, and cost. Um, we're taking several seconds to perform these kinds of operations. Some of these companies are claiming they can do one foot uh, per second, but I think there is still room for improvement in complexity, cost, and, and uh, speed, uh, optimizing those fruit quality for certain uh, kind of technologies as a second catch. We need to continue to improve the, the impact on fruit and, and minimize damage. Some of the opportunities around it, soft robotics, uh, soft hands certainly, but also soft arm that we are looking at at Washington State University. They could be really fast and they could be really affordable compared to, for example, some of the arms we saw here, they may cost $30,000, $40,000. Some of the commercially, uh, some of the other arms that are being used in, in, in these commercial uh, ready products or, or those products that we're trying to commercialize, it may cost like five to 10,000, but we're looking at soft amps that may cost just a thousand dollars. So that, these are, there are some of those improvements. We're looking at modular technologies and multi-purpose machines, human machine collaboration, as I mentioned earlier. And certainly we always try to use transdisciplinary collaborative, collaborative approaches so that these trees are um, being improved for robotic operations while the, the engineering solutions are also being improved together as a system. 
Um, just as an example, here is this kind of uh, accessible modular technology examples. It's not just tech, when I say technology, it's not just machines, but also horticultural technologies that bring these trees to the type that we like and uh, cell phone based and small robotic solutions all work together as, as accessible and modular technologies. Finally, I would like to just provide this kind of a, share this concept of what I call a control center, human cyber physical system, where field operations is now in offices uh, more than in the field. Um, we have remote supervision, remote operation using artificial intelligence, 3D sensing, uh, virtual and augmented reality. Um, uh, so that we can avoid uh, dangerous working situations in the field, uh, but also provide uh, job opportunities for people who may not otherwise be able to work in the field climbing up and down those ladders with 40 pounds of fruit. So this is another concept we're looking at. Finally, this is my last slide, and there is my contact information there. Finally, I'd like to share one new concept our center is trying to pursue. Uh, Dr. Chinjang, our director is there, who has been leading this so far, but I'm really closely involved. Uh, is robotic solutions become more commonplace in the future? We anticipate at least uh, that in the next 10, 15 years, we'll start to see a lot of these kinds of robots working in specialty crops and other crops. Uh, so like tractor test laboratory in Nebraska, maybe there are others in the world, I'm not sure. Each and every tractor that is produced today has to go through a testing laboratory and come up with a, a report, a standardized report before it could be sold. We would like to come up with a similar testing laboratory, robotic system tech testing laboratory at CPAS, Center for Precision Automated Agricultural Systems, to serve the robotic agricultural systems of future. Nebraska, Nebraska Testing Lab was created some 100 years ago, and they're doing so great now after 100 years. I think we would be the next similar example in this space if we start today and get some support. And there has been some discussion already at college level, um, but again, I'm just sharing that with, with, with all the dignitaries, our leadership here. We'll be continuing to push that, that envelope and uh, hopefully we we'll create this lab that will serve the, the nation and the, the world for the next 100 years. With that, thank you very much, Jill, for the opportunity. And we're just a little bit behind on our time, but I thought we would uh, I'd offer the opportunity to ask one or, one or two questions. And I can bring the microphone to you. Any questions? Any questions online? Okay. All right. So okay. And next, we will uh, we'll move on to uh, innovation in the uh, dairy in dairy technologies. And we're pleased to have uh, Dr. Marcos uh, Marcondes, and he's an assistant professor in animal science, and he specializes in feed evaluation, management strategies, nutrient requirements, and the economics of dairy operations. Welcome. Thank you, Jill, from for the invitation, for the introduction. Um, I'll have a different uh, approach here. I will focus way more on uh, labor and how is the interaction between the dairy industry and labor, labor savings or labors in general. Um, oh, this is not work. Okay, so um, the world about needing <clears throat> lot of our food and how is uh, actually labor play a role in that? Uh, we're still trying to figure out. Um, so analog technologies have been changing agriculture for centuries. So just an example of how many hours we would need per uh, acre. So 38 hours, that's for corn in the 1900s. By 1960s, uh, uh, about 10 hours. I guess now it's about half of that, or maybe less than half of that per acre. 
So actually we are using less and less and less labor in the agriculture. I will tell you that from the dairy industry, that's completely the opposite or it's a different story, not completely the opposite, but it is a different story. So everything you see in the agriculture and every time that you look at agriculture or look at the, the last presentation, see we are replacing our labors by robots. Maybe in the dairy industry, we have something else to say, okay? So, uh, so during the later half of 20th century automation to inform how certain commodities and varieties uh, were grown and processed along with market change, uh, with market changes in labor. So we all know that the US depended a lot on the Central America labor. Uh, currently about 75% of our labor or farm workers are uh, uh, migrant, uh, migrant labors or off migrant labors. That is a lot. However, there is a lot of recent limitations in immigrations. Okay, a lot of new restrictions. And we all know that it's uh, for the following uh, 20, 30, 50 years, uh, that's gonna change or continue to change. Uh, we all know that automation plays, plays a huge part, a, a, a huge, um, a role in this, um, but it, we also have another problem with I, which I highlight here, which is the high turnover rate of labor um, caused by injury, illness. But in the dairy industry, whenever you go, every farmer you ask, they always complain about high turnover labors in the dairy industry. Always, they always complain. Uh, I also lead the dairy challenge team from our department. We visit several farms and they all say, uh, you want to fix my problem with heat stress, with my uh, nutrition. I want a, a, a solution for my labor problem. And the students and even us can never uh, answer that question. It's really, really hard. We discuss that a lot within the industry, within farmers, within uh, even the students, it's really hard to keep labor, uh, the turnover uh, in a very low rate in the dairy industry. Remember that like the dairy workers or the milk apprentices, they have to wake up very early in the morning, it's a very intense labor, and it's really, really hard. If you've seen um, a milker working in a milking parlor, it's really, really, really fast and really tiresome work. Okay, so it is a, a very hard job to do for sure. Um, also, the agricultural labor is gradually aging. So uh, in the past, it was something almost natural. If you were a son or a daughter of a milker or a dairyman, you would take over that farm in the future. And they don't want that anymore. They don't want to wake up at 4 or 3 a.m. in the morning to mute their cows. This kind of thing. They just don't want it. The new generation, they are avoiding this at maximum. So uh, replacing this, uh, uh, if I can say so, like the old generation, it's been a huge problem in the dairy industry. Um, so we're going to uh, continue with that. So producers typically say that they respond to labor uh, losses by Increasing wages, they try to increase uh, wages, but remember probably dairy is one of the agriculture um, project that works in a, 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 a very tiny margin. It's really hard for them to increase uh, wages. Sometimes reducing output, if you don't have enough uh, uh, labor force to milk a thousand cows, you will milk maybe less, you sell a bunch of cows. Uh, relocate, relocating their operation that's doing, uh, uh, occurring a lot. For instance, in California, they're all moving towards Idaho or Texas. Those are the main states. It's almost impossible to milk cows in California if you don't have 10,000 cows or so. So what we call smaller operations, they're all moving mainly towards Idaho and uh, Texas. Uh, going out of business, that's for sure. Uh, you all know that this is happening. But mostly, but there's a typo here, sorry, diminished farm labor supply could incentivate their farmers to invest in labor safety technology. So they are uh, moving towards automation. Um, is that good or bad? Um, we, we'll see, well, we'll try to see by the end of the talk. So uh, right now, or at least a few years ago, 
we were uh, in a situation where actually uh, the adoption of labor saving technologies is not only an option, but also a need. They, are, they, they need that. Of course, with new technology, there's new opportunities. I'll try to show you that there's a lot of new data out there because of these new technologies being implemented in the farm. However, um, um, there, there, there are like uh, downsides of it as well. So the new scenario, the application of automat automat automation technology is a growing trend in the livestock industry and plays an important role in the future prospects. So mostly identification, reports, feeding, uh, that's not really uh, um, so much used right now or, or completely automated feeding. But in the past, we used by hand feeding. Now we have automatic uh, PMR wagons, uh, milking, that's probably most of you have been, uh, have been thinking about it. When you think about automate or automation in the area, you think about robots, right? Uh, we'll talk about those later. Detection of astro, detection of birth behavior, and many other farm operations can be done. So there are, I will show you a few of them more, but there is no, when I talk about automation, I'm not talking only about um, robot milking. Okay, but specifically for any AMES or automated milking system, uh, reduced labor demand, better social circumstance for the dairy farmers, especially because not always you have to wake up at four or five in the AM to milk your cows. Only if you get an alarm, they will let you know that you have to wake up and go there and check your cows. There's something going on with that cow. In the in the past, every every mastitis case is in a farm. They will, there will be an alarm. Now the robots are much better. So they will automatically milk that cow separately from the bulk tank, separate that milk. And then maybe during the afternoon milk or during the other milk, you start treating that cow for mastitis. Uh, you could do improvement animal health and well being because that robot also traces um, how healthy that cow is. So usually, whenever the cow um, is sick, she will decrease her number of steps per day, for instance, to make it easier for you to understand. So with that, there's an alarm that will tell you that cow might or might not be sick, but you can go there and check, or should go there and check that cow. So you actually uh, end up uh, identifying uh, diseases in earlier stages whenever you have automation in the farm. Um, and increased milk yields, there are still debates, um, the research, does not tell you that, the industry does. Actually, the ones who are selling the robots, of course, they will tell you that you will increase milk production, but, but all the research that we put the all, uh, both, let's say both cows or both system uh, side by side with ideal management, they don't show an increase in milk production. Okay, but anyways, there is, uh, this, is this will be out there, you'll see some, some of that. So actually, uh, what we need to understand with the automation is that we are not only switching from a need, but we are switching from a scenario where automation is the solution for a, a labor issues to try to find benefits from uh, auto, uh, automation other than labor. So uh, when I'm trying to say that automation, so in the dairy industry, labor is probably not the access of what are going to happen with the labor or with the people working for the dairy industry. Actually, we still lack labor in the dairy industry. We need more, okay? Actually, automation in agriculture and other livestock systems are good because they will move into the dairy system. Uh, most of the cases, most of the farm. It really is a scale dependent um, um, thought. So if we're talking about farms, uh, small farms, like in the Northeast of the country, like 120, 200 cows, Maybe that is a problem if you replace, if you put two, three or four robots, you really don't need labor because the family can do uh, everything else. So easily you have um, um, two or three people in the family working for that dairy and the robots, you do all, all everything you need in the farm. I visit several uh, farms in Europe or even here in the US, they basically is just the family working. So in this case, Yes, you won't need that, uh, the, your staff anymore. Um, the family will do all the business. 
However, here in the West, our farm, our farms, uh, they don't have 200 cows. They have 2,000 cows, 20,000 cows. In this case, there is an opportunity there, even if you implement 10, 15 robots, what you're gonna do with all the labors? Well, there's a lot else to do in a dairy farm other than milking cows. And that is something that people uh, that are not from the dairy industry, most of the time they don't understand. They think that adding the robots to the farm will actually replace all the, all the labor that is in there. That's actually not true. And I'm, I'll try to show you why. Uh, but there is a minor problem with that that we're gonna talk about. So the dairy industry have, has undergone a profound transformation moving towards an intensive large scale production unit, which is the case of the West here in the US. Technology adoption in their units allows for higher milk yield and lower per unit cost. Remember, we have a very tight margin, mainly for labor saving innovations. The percent, per, percentage of US dairy farms that utilize robots is expected to increase 20 to 30%. Uh, annually for the foreseeable future, mainly in the north east of the country, not in the west, because they have smaller farms. If you go to the east, you see a lot of robots being implemented over there. In countries like Sweden, Denmark, uh, they have about like 50% of their farms are already robots. Okay, so, and the, their farms are very uh, closer to what the northeast has. Um, so it's a 1.6 billion industry already. So it's a huge industry. So um, I'm gonna show you before we go to that discussion um, about labor and then back to the discussion of labor, I'm gonna show you, show you like four or five examples. They're just examples of automation and what we can gain out of those and something that are already being implemented in some farms. For instance, Dillaval already uh, suggests they already installed cameras. They can uh, implement a body condition score system. So the body condition score, you evaluate how fat the cow is. And for those who doesn't know uh, the, the management of a dairy car farm, we all, so the scale is from one to five and we always targeting three, okay? Um, it, if you have 2000 cows, you cannot go out there to the pens and check for a cow by cow. That's impossible. However, if you have an automated system that can identify um, the body condition score of every single cow, every single day, you can somewhat uh, prepare a plan to improve that system. That is a very new technology. We have a lot of problems with those because our cows are black and white. And usually cameras, they do understand or they need a contrast, but not within the same animal. If you have... <laughs> All white or all black is going to be way easier. So I do have a, a, a project with that, a paper I published uh, with that. And we have like, we spend like six months only preparing the program to identify that those stains are still a cow. So they would like actually cut the cow for all the, the color. So it's really hard to actually identify the cow. Uh, but they, they, they're improving a lot. Uh, and uh, it's very, very, very common. You go to a dairy farm and see either uh, too many fat cows or too many thin cows. Most of the time, they overfed them underfed cows. So most of the time, they are too fat. So uh, cows that are too fat, they lose production, they lose reproduction. Mostly, mo uh, most of the problems are reproduction. And if the cows don't reproduce, they don't stay in the farm, they are killed. So we are also always talking about lifespan of a cow. So we need to keep those cows longer in the farms, also for the for humanitarian reasons and so forth. But if they don't reproduce, if they don't get pregnant, they don't stay in the farm. So technology like this can, can for sure um, improve the lifespans uh, of the cows in a farm. Uh, anyways, uh, we do have several technologies this needs to be improved. Some of them are already being implemented. For now, they are kind of an extra, depending on how much you're, spend, uh, you're spending. The, for instance, the Laval will give you this camera for free. I know that GIA is uh, uh, producing a new one as well, but it's still, uh, it's quite, um, um, can be a quite pain in the future. 
Okay, what is the problem with body condition score? You need to train your staff. And even with high educated students, it's hard to train them to identify a good body condition score. Imagine with farm labor that don't, most of them don't speak English and they are super tired, waking up 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in the morning, they want to go there. They're feeding the cows in the pen, the cows are there, they look at that cow, She's too thin, oh, I'll leave it. I'll, I'll check on that call later. And uh, that person will never come back to that pen. Whenever uh, you have an automated system that will raise an alarm to the farmer, you have this pen that 50% of your cows are under the, the ideal body condition score. You need to check what is going on with that pen or so. So that's something that uh, will come up in the future for sure uh, as a better alternative. We all know body condition score. That is for, for sure the most important management tool in a dairy farm and they are not well uh, or properly used in a farm. We don't have a well-trained labor to do so. That's the best manage, management tool in a dairy farm for sure. Uh, not the, the cameras, but the body condition score itself. Vision, uh, vision system, there are a few uh, systems like this that can actually trace your cow, identify if the cow is eating or not. So you could potentially check uh, every single pen. If you put cameras over there, they will identify the cow and identify if she's eating or not and raise an alarm. There's a sick cow in that pen, she's not eating and so forth. Um, again, new technology, she could also identify uh, a lame cow, okay, if she's walking properly or not, if she's aching her back or so forth, that's some, something new as well. Mastitis detection, installing cameras in the milking parlor, according to the other temperature, uh, you can clearly see in the graph here that there's uh, something different with that cow. And then um, again, an alarm could come to the farmers a cell phone and then the cell phone, uh, the farmer could check with the labor if that is actually, if some, some management uh, was done with that cow. Whereas the parasitis control, especially for organic farms, for instance, there's a huge problem, ticks in, in hosting cows. There are cameras that can identify that you, you cross some sort of boundaries or limits of number of ticks that uh, animal has or not, especially in grazing. Uh, systems again. The 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 obstacle uh, the obstacles will be the problems of a black and white cow. In a Jersey cow, this would work much better than hosting for now. Detection of estrus that's been used for several years, depending on how many steps on on, on how agitated the cow is uh, daily, they will identify or not that cow. If the cow's in heat or not, you go there. 12 hours after the, uh, after heat detection and inseminate that cow. That's a lot used. Rumen as well, rumination is being used a lot. We can use pedometers for that or collars. So with collars, we can also identify ruminations and so forth. Also the calf feeding development, automatic feeders. That's a huge problem in a farm. Uh, there's a, a, an ideal uh, process that you have to go with the, the calf. You should increase milk intake after a certain age. You should decrease slowly, uh, decrease milk intake so the, the calf should increase uh, concentrate intake. That might be easy with 10 calves, but with 10,000 calves, that is almost impossible. So in the end, you do a group to winning, which is not really uh, on the uh, humanitarian side of raising those calves and so forth. So automation plays an important role in terms of how do we raise our calves in the farm. Okay, there's a lot of gun, uh, uh, good things about automatic feeders for cats. Uh, and I already talked about automated milking systems. Um, and again, they will replace the milkers and you have automated milking system. Although for robots, each robot can deal with only 60 cows, 60, 70 cows at most. Remember, if you have 10,000 cows, you can make the calculations how many robots you need, $150,000 per robot, plus a, about $150,000 of uh, renovations you have to do in the farm to install that robot. So it's hugely expensive. But that's not uh, what I want to discuss my last like uh, two or three minutes. 
It's like, what will you do with that labor? If you're implementing all those uh, innovations in a farm, it means that maybe you don't need that labor or that staff anymore. Um, so actually, there's several things you're gonna do. Every farm you go, I'm a nutritionist, I'm a dairy nutritionist. And I think that is like impressive how they can have like 10,000 cows on one diet for 10,000 cows. That's the, the, I'm sorry, the, the most absurd thing in a dairy farm. They're losing money. They are just flowing money out of the sink by doing that. What's their justification for not doing that? Labor. That's their justification. I don't have the labor. Um, well, but it's just like a machine. You can program your diet. Nowadays, you program your diet in a, in a truck, in a TMR wagon truck, and the TMR wagon truck will load whatever you want it. Oh, but my labor is not trained to do that. I cannot train my labor to program, program the computer and so forth. There is a big problem. They are flooding money out of the sink by doing one diet for 10,000 cows. And I'll tell, I'll tell you that the great majority of farm team in the US do that. What else? Uh, check body condition score, metritis check, uh, on farm mastitis, health check, uh, etc. All those amazing technology that we develop here in the university and research centers, they're not being applied in the farm because they don't have the people to do that. Either they don't have enough people or they the people are not well trained. They were not trained enough to do that. So there's a huge opportunity also. Those new technologies they generate hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of data per day. They have absolutely no idea what to do with that data. Okay, the, the company go to the farmer and say, you're gonna see this, you're gonna see that, you're gonna have this, this and that information. The farmer, the great majority of the dairymen have no idea of what to do with that data. Okay, what we are, we, we suggest is we need to reallocate all those, those, those people that were doing something else and we need to train them. And the university and Washington State as a land grant university and other land grant universities are there to train these new people. Okay, so we need to train those for this new perspective. So all the jobs they could do in the farm. So for sure in dairy farms, especially big dairy farms, automation is a solution for lack of labor, but it's an opportunity for training. For instance, milkers, they're not be milking anymore, but what can they do instead? So we're gonna train them to do some other tasks. Um, just to remind you a couple of slides real quick to remind you that we had a problem with uh, overflow of labor uh, uh, and that and only ended in November, 2020. So there were, the Washington Dairy Federation was dealing with this huge lawsuit against the dairy farm here in Washington because they were all uh, um, overflowed with workers, uh, with labor, all labor were overflowed with time with work. So they have to deal with that, which means that we don't have enough labor. Automation will make them work a little less or within their limits or within what they should work and so forth. Um, so they should not work over time. So some future perspective, technologies affect management, labor and production. The number of tariffs has decreased substantially while the average herd size has increased. Consequently, more dairies depend on higher labor. Um, so this authors remark that the field of their technology, despite the increase, is just in infancy. So we will have more technology going on. That does not mean that we're gonna uh, throw all those people uh, in the streets. Uh, no, dairy can absorb, the dairy industry can absorb this new, uh, this new technology for sure, at least for a while. Uh, the they predict the future characterized by precision dairy farming in which farmers, personnel and advisors use sensor-derived data to determine best practice uh, on the farm. Improved data collection and analysis could raise efficiency and profitability, <clears throat> but proper research, training, and skill acquisition, this is the most important part. The labor is there, but they don't know how to do. They need us, okay? So final remarks, my last slide, the modern global agriculture industry is more efficient than any time in the past. Labor safety technology exhibits a considerable impact on labor demand and supply and therefore usually have a significant policy implications. 
From a policy perspective, mechanization technology might lead to decreased demand for labor. That's in agriculture, probably not uh, in, in dairy for the, the following years. Consider the impact on economic agents, labor saving technologies are adopted because they can potentially increase revenues and reduce labor in inputs. However, to ensure adopters, labor saving must be economically viable. The labor availability appears to be decreasing. The demand for labor has remained relatively constant with 1 million workers at the annual average since 2007. 2007. Nonetheless, a widespread shortage of agricultural labor has not yet happened. And lastly, labor saving, labor enhancing technology appears as promising alternatives. Besides mitigation labor dependency, this technology could add other benefits such as improvement of working conditions in the Okay, uh, sorry about the time, but thank you. I can uh, open it to one or two questions if there's any questions from the audience. Chuck? Yeah, so you mentioned, oh, sorry. So you mentioned about the retraining um, of the workforce for new skill sets. So I guess um, this goes back to President Schultz's comments, um, the land grant system and, and extension, are we prepared to change the methods of teaching and training for that workforce redevelopment? Um. Uh, my opinion is that we are prepared because the, the mean, well, maybe not because we need to speak Spanish. That's the first thing, right? We need to speak Spanish. 75% of our labor force, maybe more. Uh, but, other, but other than that, I think we do have the knowledge when we do have the tools to teach them. We need to fight the resistance from them. They will have some resistance not only from the farmer, but also from the labor form. Sometimes they are, they are afraid of new technology as we were sometimes in the past. It's also gonna have to be placed if you aren't gonna to come to our campus and have to go to the farm. Yeah, but, and then that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's for sure. We have to go to the farm and this kind of thing. Uh, um, knowledge wise, I think we are, we do have the technology. We need to work on the language uh, limitations we have. And again, yes, for sure. Um, we need to travel to the places and to get there to, to train them and to cross that resistance that they have uh, linked to the university, going there and teach them how to do it. But I think we are. Thank you. Next up, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor David Zilberman from the University of California, Berkeley. David holds the Robinson Chair in Agricultural and Resource Economics at Berkeley. His expertise is in agricultural and environmental policy, water marketing, risk management, and especially the economics of innovation and biotechnology and biofuels. And David was the 2019 recipient of the Wolf Prize in Agriculture, and he is a member of the National Academies of Sciences. Welcome, David. Okay, it's a, it's, a real, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks, uh, Dean and the committee for inviting me, uh, me. And it was really, really amazing uh, to hear the lectures and uh, to think about uh, actually the big uh, progress that we made. I actually picked apples and fell from trees. So, and uh, also work on dairy and uh, milk cows. And uh, maybe tell you a little episode that can tell you the economics. When I was in Israel in the 1960s, we were picking apples and there was a labor shortage. So people developed a hydraulic machine to pick apples. And then they had the six day war and then suddenly they have cheap labor and suddenly everything stopped. And to some extent, a labor uh, shortage has really affected us. So if I look at my talk, I'll try to speak a little bit about concepts that economics have and emphasize some of the lessons of the past and then see what, what happens when we go to the future. 
So generally, uh, there are several basic uh, concepts in economics that are really important, especially when we, when we discuss a lot of the issues that are associated with uh, technology adoption. The first concept is the issue of induced innovation. Generally, scarcity leads to development in technology. It's a combination of scarcity and new scientific knowledge. When you have this combination, suddenly you have new technologies. Now, in order that it will be adopted, you need to have a perception of profitability. It's not enough to have a technology to, uh, to, 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 to be adopted and to be profitable. And you need two elements, knowledge and human capital and entrepreneurial, and sp uh, entrepreneurial spirit and credit. So a lot of time people have new technologies. I really enjoy, don't enjoy actually, it says every time I go to international organization, you have people that say, we have these technologies, why no one adopted, adopted, farmers are stupid. It's not that the farmers are stupid, you don't develop a supply chain and a marketing and think about how you bring it so the farmer can use it. So you really need it and therefore, it's not enough to have the technology, you need to supply chain that to look at it all the way from the, in, from the innovation to the farmers. Now, the other thing is about adoption. There is a lot of people, include many economies, that think that adoption is about limitation. That's not true. There are three, several elements of adoption. First is awareness. You need to know that technology exists. And that's where imitation comes. And awareness is in many ways, commercial extensions, word of mouth, but it's only awareness. Then you have assessment, and assessment is important. Every person, the smartest and the dumbest, assess, is it good for me? And the number one thing that people ask, does the technology fit me? It may be brilliant, but if I don't know how to do it, it won't work. There was this like a lecture about what will happen to people that uh, will move the, uh, lose the job in the farm. Now we need, and I'll speak about it. Well, well, now we need, uh, uh, there are new jobs. Generally, what we know from history, the good thing about aging is that you retire. I will retire soon. Because you will have, basically what happened, you have to educate new generation of people that have new skill. It's very, very difficult to take a 50 year old guy that never used a computer and making a computer program. So to some extent, one of the key elements is that you have to make sure that the technology is appropriate for, for persons. So demographic is the biggest enemy of technology adoption. The only thing that accelerates technology adoption is a crisis. So to some extent, you have to recognize when it comes to adoption, you have awareness, you have assessment, you have choice, and then you have economic circumstances. And a lot of time, crisis trigger change or opportunity trigger change. Opportunity generally maybe will be one third as effective as crisis. So to some extent, these are things that, 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 that are important. Why? Because a lot of time you need to have a backload of technologies so they will be available when the crisis occurs. I didn't give a talk about drip irrigation, but I study irrigation in the United States. Drip irrigation generally hardly has adopted, but every time to have a crisis, another sector enters to this thing. So to some extent, the thing about uh, innovation, you need to have a backlog of innovation all the time. And when the crisis occurs, you need to have the <coughs> sales force and the uh, cleverness to be able to put, to put them forward. Another thing is that farmers are heterogeneous. There is nothing like a representative farmer. They are heterogeneous in terms of age, in terms of capacity, in terms of interest. So you realize that you always need to find who is the person that will adopt first. And that is the problem because people say, God, we are in a democracy. Why don't you give everyone the opportunity? There are, in most cases, very few farmers that will be able to adopt the technology and then it goes down the line for people that really are interested in technology to others. The other thing that is important, not all the technologies are adopted by all the farmers. Sometimes small farmers can survive if you have companies that trend the technology. So you can maintain a diverse agriculture if at the same time you have some people that own machine and some people that develop machines that basically rent it to others. So to some extent, the fact that you have a machine that have elements of economic of scale is not a problem if you have agents that rent the machine. If you look at the history of US, combined were shared by many. I don't know a lot of farmers in California that have uh, 
laser leveling, but almost every farmer uses it because you want it. So to some extent, you really need to understand it. And then there is an element of learning by doing it. The key element is companies that improve the technology <clears throat> by learning by doing, and farmers improve the technology by learning by using. So it's a dynamic game. It is moving all the time. And that is really uh, important. Later on, I'll speak about the uh, uh, land grant college. And it's very important to have good product support. It's not enough to produce a good uh, product. You need to have the marketing, and you need to have the supply chain. And a lot of time, when we look at the university, we forget that you really depend on the supply chain. You need to educate people that will be working and knowing how to work with consumers. You need to develop good logistics that people will feel good about adopting the technology. No one will adopt technology if he knows that no one will support. So what are the basic features of US agriculture? I really think that the key element of US agriculture has been the land grant college and what are called the educational industrial complex. That is really unique here. What do you mean by the educational industrial complex? People make inventions, then they move to startup, then they move to company. There is this movement all the time. Now, you have a lot of countries say, it's, uh, people say it's unpure that scientists, that scientists are getting in business. It's even less pure if they're not invited. If they are not in business. Almost all the big innovations started when the researcher that was in academic university moved all the way and started the company and they move it forward, directly or indirectly. And I think that it's good in the US that, that uh, we are explicit about it. Every, an advanced economy with infrastructure, and it's very important that we will have uh, the, the web system and the internet will be developed. Farmers, uh, are ambitious and the government is very important. Supportive government is not price support. Supportive government means support for research, support for education, support for infrastructure, developing very good primary and high school education. These are very, very important, more than a price support. If you look at California agriculture and Washington agriculture, they survive very well without subsidies forever. Maybe in wheat, you need some sort of intervention. But the key role of the government, at least in my view, is to provide the, it is to provide the infrastructure of human capital uh, to develop agriculture. Now I move very fast to so the history of US agriculture. There were about three uh, periods. One was the settlement from 1750 to 1890. In 1819, people reached the Washington state and said, God, we cannot farm the ocean. So what happened? We moved to intensification. And intensification was really crucial because an intensification be, uh, benefited from the land grant college. So yield, if you look at the 20th century, yield moved immensely. They were the same till about 1920. The other thing is sustainability. The 20th, 21st century people care about sustainability, about climate change, about uh, about uh, natural resource base, and and a look at it globally. So what happened? We have innovations that we have I have to and we Brazil, Argentina feed the world. We have high capital intensity. <coughs> we still have environmental side, side, uh, side effects, but also another thing. Agriculture is moving from commodities to differentiated products. And we really cannot speak about agriculture, we can speak about agri-food supply chain. To me, the thing that killed my discipline, Agricon, and most of the art school, that we don't think about the supply chain. We, we think about farming, they are a small part of it. And they are the, in many ways, they are, the farming itself becomes very simpler and simpler and simpler. Still, you don't need human, but the system itself, the supply chain, is complex. And what I will mention later on, that to me, this can be the golden era of the agri food system because agri agriculture can move to something that I can call the bioeconomy. So if it would be up to me, if I was Dean, I'm 75 and I never wanted the job, but if I was Dean, what I would do, I would change the name of the school from School of Agriculture and Natural Resource School of the Bioeconomy because agriculture is much more than producing food. With climate change and food security and non-renewable resources, we can do much more and we have incredible capacity in biology, we have to utilize it. Now, now let's go a little bit about the West, what happened in the West. So 
In the West, you have two elements. Like in Washington State, you have areas where they live the pollution, where they grow wheat, and then you have fruit and veggies. Basically, what happened, the railroad basically provided demand. Innovations led to mechanized agriculture. Then there was a crop, a crop breeding, farm size increases. Basically, what happened is farm size increases, and farmers today, especially in feed crop in the Midwest, they may be complaining, but they are doing well. To me, the main reason to keep ag policy today, to especially policy that support main crops like wheat, etc., is to maintain land prices. And to me, that's a, very, that's a nice objective for individuals that pay, pay a campaign, but it's not an objective for a country. Now, we have to produce food, we have to increase productivity, but we don't need land prices at the market determinant. The other thing is fruit and veggies. Now, the fruit and veggies benefit from government activities, from water projects. Now, in the past, we had, um, um, uh, till 1960, we have something called the Bracero program that uh, brought people from Mexico. And in the South, you basically have uh, the situation of hair cropper that were mostly black and the, so you have cheap labor and the four fruit and vegetables wasn't very uh, developed. Now, the universities did an incredible job in terms of crop breeding and vibrant prospecting. Think about it. We didn't know nothing 100, 150 years ago about growing fruit and vegetables in America. People went all over the world and now we have the best in almonds and grapes and who knows what. And this is because of academic research that really take took advantage of, but surpassed what was done in Europe for many, many years. If you look at almond and olives and other things that are European, we grow it much better. And this is a huge achievement of the land grant system. And uh, the West becomes the, the center of many fruit and vegetables. And it, and it world class performance. But if you look at a US agriculture today, we have two agriculture. You have the Midwest with the wheat and that is basically more like Brazil or Ukraine or Russia or Australia. And then you have Florida and California and uh, a little bit in Michigan and about five pieces in Georgia and uh, that are totally different and they work with Israel and Australia and some countries in Europe. And you have two systems that are it, they, that are different, but have a lot of sin in common. The land grant system gave, gave them a lot of uh, power, okay? So what happened in the 1960s? Suddenly the Bracero program disappeared. One reason it disappeared was besides the political upheaval is the cotton harvester. The cotton harvester is a huge invention. Once it entered, suddenly you really did need a lot of hair copper in the South. So, so, so you started have the great migration. And you, and you have the Bracero program was abolished, what happened? The first thing after the Bracero program was abolished, people invented the tomato harvester. It was a controversy, but suddenly you move to automation. You start having unionization. At the same time, you have cold storage and refrigerated rack. Even though we lost labor, this was a golden era of agriculture in the West because we start automation, if you grow lettuce and tomatoes and other crops, they move from a very primitive system to more advanced system, and we start exporting stuff uh, everywhere. The other thing, uh, metal bromide, but altogether the West becomes the center of fruit and vegetable in this period, despite of the fact that we lost labor, because what happened? Labor become, you become a permanent professional uh, worker on the, on the farm, you start having consultants or pest control for irrigation, et cetera. And then labor it was provided by contractors and it continued till, the, uh, till these days. Now, in the 90, from the 1990 to 2000, there was another round. There was the opening uh, with China, growing demand for food, increased demand for uh, unique product characteristics. Again, uh, prepackaged salads, which is a huge industry suddenly increase the value of agriculture and uh, make, make agriculture much, much more interesting. Digitization that driven by supplier and buyer, more contracting 
and automation. So we really now move to a system that is totally different. It's not that you have a lot of market and small farmers and the market sell to a farmer market. You really have an integrated supply chain that is not reflected in the way we think and speak at the universities. We really have a system that whatever Walmart, Walmart or whoever says, or whoever is a, is a seller, it can be Walmart or a boutique. The farmer is producing for some sort of demand. Now, this is also is in Europe. Now, you have a lot of rural sociologists and activists that this is terrible, but this is the world. This is the way computer operates. This is the way that every other industry operates in this world. You don't want to be working and producing a homogeneous product. You want to have a differentiated product. You have to think differently about agriculture and, to, and, and it's entering to the 21st century and you have an opportunity. And one of the biggest things that we have in agriculture is that there is a romanticized perspective among agriculture, among activists that never know the, they don't know the difference between a cow and a chicken, and they will tell you, okay, it has to be competitive, small farm. This is very nice if you want to take your kid to pet a, to pet a chicken. I did it too. With my kids, they loved it. But if you really look at modern agriculture, it's a different era, and it actually can be healthier and can solve a lot of problems. Now, the pandemic was a big test for agri-food. Now, while the medical system, to some extent, succeeded and some extent failed when it comes to the pandemic, I think altogether, agriculture did quite well because the pressure was really incredible. The pressure at the farm, they suffered from restriction on labor, from lack of labor. In the food sector in particular, it was a huge problem. People don't come to the shop, to the, to the store. So what happened, retailers, Suddenly there was a big shift. 40% of the food in America come, go, goes to institutions, restaurants, school. Suddenly you move, have everything has to move to supermarket. The only crisis we have was the toilet paper crisis. We have a little bit of a crisis, but altogether, this was the order of magnitude crisis that, that was relatively low. Look what happened in California every time that you have a, a fire someplace. Suddenly you have shut down of all of the electricity. The food system, not only in the US, globally functioned relatively uh, uh, quite well, despite of the some food shortages. Now, what happened is that the COVID had some interesting thing. Globally, incredible diffusion of e-commerce. And I don't speak about the US, it's India, in Mexico. In India, suddenly, uh, suddenly, all, the, suddenly almost a lot of stuff is automated. Uh, oh, of course, in China, there was 400% increase in uh, uh, increase in online uh, uh, orders because people cannot leave their home. But all over the world, uh, you saw it. Business to business e-commerce in agriculture increased. Now, one problem was that big companies did better than small companies, especially companies that were uh, prepared. Companies that realized that it was a crisis, like Walmart, did very well. Other companies that didn't realize that it's a crisis didn't read very well. But it's the idea that I mentioned before, have the infrastructure, be ready when the crisis okay, you respond really proved itself in, in, in the pandemic. Now, the interesting thing what happened in restaurants and uh, the, the restaurants that shifted to, uh, to takeout succeeded. If you could, you did. Hotels suddenly realized that they need to have permanent resident in the hotel. If you look at something in hotel, that a lot of hotels decided, okay, from now on, we have guests and we try to develop some element for elderly or whoever, so our kitchen can operate. But we have to look at the supply chain in general and we can have this thing. Now, people call it pivoting. What is pivoting? This is the world of the pandemic. That you have, if you have a supply chain that you have, a, some that grows apple, it goes to a processor, the, from the processor it goes to the retailer and the consumer, suddenly you have a situation that some processor will go directly to the retailer, some retailer will go directly to the consumer, you have uh, Uber food, you develop all these adaptations. And to me, we need to understand it. It's part of agriculture as well as everything else. And some farmers will move in to sell to consumers. I, I know I, 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 we did a study all over the world. Uh, and and because I'm from Israel, and so I know in Israel, some farmers will take a truck 
go to a neighborhood and basically get, and, and send emails to all the people in the neighborhood, I come with a truck and I have it. And it's, it's happened in, not only in Israel, it's happened in many other countries. So people develop new mechanisms of market, things that I think will stay there uh, together. Uh, so, so I have several examples. Uh, uh, there is a, a, a company in, uh, I think, in South Carolina that basically a grocery startup that is a drive through supermarket. Uh, the, uh, some farmers uh, in Illinois uh, move, move, uh, move from restaurant to people uh, flawlessly. So ability to adjust and to use, uh, use computers to recognize new clientele was really crucial and people mostly did it well. Of course, some people uh, didn't do it as well, but I think that this is something that is very, very important. So what happened is that the pandemic really changed the way that uh, we think about farming in America and think about what we do and how we manage the food in America. And despite of the fact that altogether it, it caused incredible effect on food security, the damage food security was much less than the damage on education. And I think that the system responded quite well because of entrepreneurship, because of ability, and in countries that you didn't have the capacity to deal with, uh, the capacity to deal with, uh, to take advantage of the internet, you didn't have the infrastructure of the, of the internet, or you didn't have the human capital, it didn't work as well as in other countries. So in India, it worked very well because they have the, they have some of the skill, and uh, in other countries, it, it, it didn't work as well. So, but oh, Brazil, for example. But altogether, I think that we realize our crisis for the problem. So where we are now? Now we have a situation that number one, that minimum wage is going up for several years. There are workers closed, that is domestic and international. There is aging. Now, at the same time, precision entered to the world. I was working on precision farming 40 years ago, we started writing papers, and precision is three elements, to be, be able to monitor, to evaluate and implement. Monitoring was developed 30 years ago with uh, remote sensing and the GPS and the, all this other stuff at GIS, but having a lot of data is not enough. You need to do something about it. So what you do, you have artificial intelligence, you have all these technologies and you need the, but if, even if you have a solution, how you implement it? So there were a lot of failure in the US to introduce precision farming because the implementation tool wasn't there. But now we have drones, now we have much more uh, efficient way to locate things and to send them there. And uh, so to some extent, I think that we will really see that precision system have a chance. On one hand, and labor is expensive. On the other hand, we have all the elements of precision that are really increasing. And they are generally the result of other industry. The result of cell phone and the, and, and the competition about who has the best camera. The result of a lot of uh, defense industry. Drone is a result of defense, no doubt about it. And so we learn from other industries uh, about how the potential for precision are, and I think it will be big. Another thing is that financing be interested in ag investment. They realize that there are some fundamental issues, high labor costs, growing demand in the future. And what happened is that we will have this type of revolution, we want it or not, and, the, and it's the role of the university to work with industry and to develop these technologies. Now, in California, there was a big reluctance to do uh, agricultural engineering because of the tomato harvester. I don't know if you are aware of it, but in all over the country, people say, gosh, universities should displace labor. I don't think that we have this feeling. We had it in the 1980 and 2000. We don't have this feeling. People are older. They don't want to, be, they don't want to work in the field. And the farm workers that migrate from Mexico, they don't want to be farm workers. People come from Mexico or other countries, they want to work in the city. There is altogether uh, some fundamental labor shortage because population in the US get older, we don't, there is more need. So to some extent, there is a good opportunities 
for, uh, for uh, agriculture and I think that is, the, but the demand wouldn't be for people to harvest apples, we need to have demand for professionals. And this is the opportunity for land grant colleges for two, in two ways. First, I'm a big believer in lifelong long learning. Develop mechanisms that we don't teach only 18 to 23 years old, but we develop courses that are two, three, five, six months that we train and we work in companies to train farm workers. It was a very nice thing to say, oh, look, all these farm workers will have a job. We'll train them. Are we capable to train them? Do we know in the university how to work with older people? We are working basically with kids. We have dormitories and fraternities and football and all these other things that 90% of it is that it allow you to, to grow up, but would, how, are we ready to take 30, 40 year old people with three kids? This is a huge challenge of the land grant system to develop extension that really try to develop new life skills when people basically, when old skills don't work and take it into account the changing age. This is a huge thing. This is the biggest challenge for social sciences. Don't worry about farming. It's important about farming, studying adoption. And a lot of people get money to study and to do all this experiment. But the key element is deal with older people. Now, the other thing, if you look at the future, we have climate change. This is the biggest problem. So to me, this would be the biggest era of agriculture and bioeconomy. And now the key point is that we have mechanical solutions that are great, but we have even something bigger, which is biotech. If we don't take advantage of biotech, we are in trouble because agriculture can produce three times or four times more than it produced, not only here, all over the world. Look at corn versus wheat. Look at Generally speaking, every time that people use biotech, and now we have CRISPR, and then there will be a son and grandson of CRISPR, but we have to convince the world to use this technology because we need to combine both the soil and the mechanical and the, uh, electronic with new biology. Because when everything, agriculture is a life science, if we don't take advantage of the biology, we are doomed. If we take advantage of the biology, we can solve the problem of climate change. Agriculture can provide new biofuels because if you have better photosynthesis and uh, a nitrogen fixation, which can be done with genetic engineering, you can produce biofuel that will be that will have a third of the energy emission of uh, corn, not for small car, but for big car and truck. So to me, the big challenge is to really to educate the population. And now we have a new government that to educate them that organic is not and you can make money of it, but it's basically an ornament that is, in my way, where is a waste of time and a destruction. What you really not need to do to have the education, if you really want to deal with climate change and food security and sustainability of the world, you really have to take advantage of the new, of, of new biotechnology and combine information technology with biotechnology to basically triple the capacity of agriculture to provide more income to the rural sector and I think to make all of us happier. Okay, thanks. David Silberman. Any questions online or check? So uh, great job, uh, lots of challenges, um, did a good summary. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of that stuff this afternoon. Um, but so is there a new paradigm now uh, for our culture? And, and you kind of tease that my uh, comments this afternoon will be, is there a paradigm for the food and ag systems, and I like your idea of the bioeconomy because it's not just food, but how, you know, we've that last statement there, uh, re land grant systems reinvent. I guess I'm showing my age, but I think uh, we've had reinventing the land grant system every decade um, for the last 30 or 40 years. And so why now and how do we, implement okay. that. Uh, tell, tell you two minutes. If I look at it, 
we reinvented the land grant all the time because it's a good thing from society that less and less people work in agriculture. So we changed it from agriculture to natural resources and environment, etc. But if you look at it, we went down because the value of agriculture went down. Now the value of agriculture goes up. Because we can produce biofuel, we can use chemical, we can use pharmaceutical. Basically, what happened is that now we have to move to this bioeconomy thing because agriculture is not about protecting the environment or about natural resources. That was very, that was really nice, basically, about hugging trees or liking trees. It's about producing material that cannot be produced, uh, no, uh, no, about sequestration, uh, carbon through, uh, through soil management, about changing in policies that allow you to deal with climate change. So to, to me, this is a big change. Instead of going down, you go up. So this element of the bioeconomy means that we care about food, we care about fuel, we care about the environment, we care about climate change, we care about food security. Agriculture is much more than food. And I think once you realize it, and it's a huge thing because you remember when we had uh, in 2008 and people start arguing about biofuel, people say, gosh, don't produce biofuel, there is food security. People. Now, that was the best thing that happened to agriculture because productivity went up and people in developing countries become better off. So we really said we can do more now. The biggest problem that we had in agriculture is lack of demand. How much food can you eat? Now the demand is growing because we can move from relying on oil. We basically borrowed from, from, from the di dinosaur or wherever oil for about 150 years. It's a problem. Now we can use our uh, knowledge in biology to develop a renewable system. So if you look at bioeconomy, renewability, Agriculture is more than food, it's a totally different paradigm. And the land grant system can approach and say, gosh, we can work with a medical school because we can produce medicine. We can work with a, a, with a mining engineering because instead of mining, you can uh, produce it on the trees. And we can do studies that show why biofuel by nature is better than fossil fuel because biofuel with R&D, if the productivity is gone, is going down, the greenhouse gas of uh, biofuel goes down. Uh, if it goes up, the greenhouse uh, emission of biofuel goes down. So I think it's a really new paradigm that we should really emphasize. And it generates much better, much better jobs and much more interesting jobs. And, and we locate a lot of them in the rural area. So to me, that, that is, that's a big difference. Well, thank you so much. We are a little uh, behind, so I was going to give us a 15-minute break, but maybe a seven-minute break. So uh, we're supposed to come back at uh, 10:35, and maybe a couple minutes after that. So please take a short break, and we'll start. We'll start again. Our next speaker is. Uh, Leland Glenna, who's a uh, rural sociologist from Penn State University. It turns out that he was planning to join us in person, but he has a, a health issue in his family that he that he could not travel for. So he will he will be our one speaker that is that is speaking remotely, and uh, we are moving his slides along from here. I want to encourage though everyone who is everyone who is participating online to uh, put questions in the Q and A. I put questions in the chat box and, and then we can we can include those in the questions. So we can have at least one or two questions for, for each speaker. Uh, so Leland, are you on? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, maybe a little bit louder. Can you hear me can now? You try, try again? Yes. Is this not working? All right. Uh, well, thank you for uh, this opportunity and for accommodating the fact that I couldn't travel this week. I appreciate that. Um, so I'll be uh, discussing some uh, uh, issues related to automation and artificial intelligence in um, agriculture and 
from a, a sociological perspective, uh, and I want to give a shout out to my students, uh, Maria, Mara, Vivanco, and Yetkin Borlu. They helped me do some of the analysis uh, that I'll be presenting here today. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. Next, oh, thank you. So, uh, one of the more common perspectives on uh, technology and technology adoption uh, can often be referred to as technological determinism. This refers to scientific discoveries and technological changes are inevitable and that they always contribute to social welfare. There's a connection between technology and progress. Uh, some of the related concepts that uh, are often associated with that are scientism, the notion that facts and values are distinct categories and that science is neutral, right? Science fits into the facts category and doesn't uh, intersect with, uh, with values. Uh, neoclassical economics is often associated with this kind of perspective in the sense that there's an assumption that social welfare will emerge as the aggregation of in, from the aggregation of individual level choices. And then an, another related thing is uh, Ludditism, this notion that the reason people resist uh, technology has more to do with attitudinal um, perspectives and not because of some sort of power dynamic or the fact that they might uh, be um, dispossessed as a result of some sort of technology adoption. Um, now, the counter example, the counter arguments to this, uh, these more dominant perspectives, um, generally from a sociological perspective, is that science and technology are social products. They're not inevitable. They're not, in some ways, they're not naturally occurring. Um, that social contexts shape the research agendas and the applications of science and technology. Uh, another is that power imbalances can be reinforced through technological change. And furthermore, that public policy and in particular land grant university research can shape the trajectory of innovation. All right, so we'll talk, uh, I'll, I'll give some examples of this as we uh, move forward. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the more prominent uh, theories, at least from rural sociology um, on this subject is from Bill Friedland and his uh, graduate students, Bill Friedland was a professor at the University of California at Santa Cruz for many, many years. In 1981, they did this, uh, published this um, uh, interesting study on lettuce mechanization in the lettuce industry in California. And what they sought labor dynamic. So as uh, you know, so this included the power of uh, the of the farmers vis-a-vis uh, -vis the labor, and also the ability of labor to organize and the availability of labor. And what they basically found is that mechanization in the lettuce industry was influenced by, on the one hand, the end of the guest worker program, the Bracero program, and also the end of the access then of cheap labor. But it was also about uh, as laborers began to organize, um, the challenge became how can we, uh, for the growers was how can we undermine the power of farm workers by incorporating mechanization into uh, the process. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I was on this, um, involved in this USDA funded SCRI project that ran from about 2012 to 2017. Uh, Peter Hurst, uh, a um, horticulturalist at uh, Purdue University was the principal investigator on this, but we had uh, people, plant breeders, <clears throat> uh, electro electrical engineers, computer scientists, all kinds of robotics experts from Purdue, from Penn State, from uh, Washington State University, and uh, also some, uh, some people from the private sector who were developing uh, some of these um, robotic pruning uh, mechanisms for, for market. Uh, so it was a rather large project. And uh, I was part of the uh, social science team that was brought in to help understand how 
uh, growers might or might not be interested uh, in these robo robotic pruners. So I'm just going to present a little bit of the some of the findings that we had from this project. Uh, next slide, please. So the research questions, basically, how does labor supply influence interest in adoption? And then also, how does farm and or firm structure influence the interest in adoption? Next slide, please. So we interviewed uh, 53 apple and wine grape growers uh, across the country, uh, California, New York, Pennsylvania, and Washington. We also did a survey of uh, over 2,000 apple and wine grape growers in those four states. Uh, we gathered the lists from various grower organizations and county offices in the Department of Agriculture and so forth. Uh, we had a pretty good response rate, uh, considering how difficult it is to uh, do a survey with farmers these days. It's an outstanding uh, response rate. And I'll just report on some of the bivariate and logistic regression uh, results of this analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So just some of the variables we looked at were gender, the state, you know, the geographic location, uh, farm type and the profitability of the farm, uh, various labor uh, issues, and then some attitudinal issues related to the farmers, uh, the, the apple and wine grape growers. Uh, for example, what was their perspective on manual pruning? Is that superior? Is there any way a machine could ever um, do the pruning uh, as well as manual laborers could? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our, one of our main outcome uh, dummy variables, we had a list of possible um, uh, variables trying to evaluate whether uh, people were interested in the technology. So there's a scale of basically one to five, strongly agree str to strongly disagree. And the first one was, I would never consider buying an automated pruner, right? That's the kind of the first one. And then we uh, asked questions about um, what if, uh, there was a labor shortage. What if uh, it was about the same cost? What if it was 20% cheaper and so forth? And that gave us a kind of a scale to look at. But if you just looked at, I would never consider um, what we found was um, that basically about um, 42, a little over 42% disagreed with the statement that they would never consider it, right? So that means that they would consider it. Um, and so we just did some logistic regressions on these uh, and some bivariate analysis. And I'll just run over that very briefly and then give uh, kind of a, a concluding comments based on that. Next slide, please. So this is uh, just a breakdown of I would never consider buying um, and compared to some of the other things. So um, let's see um, if they agree. Um, so what you see, if, if the machine could do similar work for the at least 20% lower cost than hand labor, right, there's more interest in that, of course, because if you could save 20%, why wouldn't you? But you can see a kind of a breakdown there of who is willing uh, to buy. Okay, next slide. This is uh, just trying to show you some of the variation in that. Okay, next, please. Uh, this just shows the farm size uh, variation. What this is, I think this is interesting, is that the, the smallest farmers and the largest farmers are the least interested in the uh, pruning, the robotic pruning technology. And as I show more information, you'll see why that's uh, likely the case. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a breakdown for uh, farm labor needs. The first uh, slide shows uh, disagreement based on number of year-round employees on the farm. So what this shows is that people with more year-round laborers were least likely or least interested in uh, the new in the, the robotic pruning technology. On the other hand, on the right side you'll, uh, of the screen, you see the number of seasonal employees on the farm. Growers with more seasonal employees are more interested in the uh, pruning technology, right? So it's the kind of laborers they're dependent on influences the, uh, the relative interest in this uh, technology. And we, through the qualitative interviews, we 
you know, at first we couldn't quite make sense of this, but then when we went back and looked at what some of the farmers were telling us in our qualitative interviews, it made sense. Next slide, please. So uh, as one uh, person put it, um, automation is more valuable when labor needs are high. So as the one grower was explained to us, their highest labor needs are during the harvest season. And furthermore, that's the time, and this was especially, they had full-time employees on this particular farm. So he said, you know, what, I have all these employees on staff mainly because I need them during the high labor times, like in harvest time. So if you brought in a pruning device, what are my workers that I hire full-time going to do when, um, when that pruning machine is working, because I have to keep them around until uh, the harvest time, right? So they're talking about they, what they really need is, you know, um, uh, mechanization during the whole production process, or otherwise it's really not that important to them. All right, next slide, please. Yeah, this is kind of saying the same kind of thing. It's we, we need mechanization through the whole production process. Otherwise, what am I going to do with these workers during uh, the times of the year uh, when uh, they're not working because of this uh, pruning machine? Uh, next slide, please. Um, another was, and this helps explain why the largest growers, if you remember back a few slides, uh, the largest growers were not all that interested in the pruning technology, that's because they could afford to hire labor at a higher cost. Uh, this was one of the largest uh, farms uh, growers that we spoke to. Um, and his quotation to me was, labor is not a problem for us. We pay $3 above minimum wage. And so if you're willing to pay for labor, labor's not a problem for these guys. And so the larger farmers can afford to pay more for labor uh, so it's more the middle range, uh, middle range and seasonal workers, right? They're, they're the ones looking more uh, for, uh, for um, robots uh, and mechanization. Next slide, please. We also found uh, some resistance to this. Uh, this question had come up a couple of times with uh, the earlier speakers too. Um, this one uh, apple grower in California told me, uh, you know, what would those families do if I automated? Um, he had, I think he had something, you know, a small number, about 10 uh, full-time workers, uh, maybe seven or eight full-time, and then a couple of other seasonal ones. And, you know, from his perspective, these are families that uh, need work and what are they gonna do? Uh, so that was also some of the, uh, the issues that came into their thinking. Um, next slide, please. So uh, some of the some of the attitudinal questions we brought up was, you know, how would you characterize your perspective on pruning egg? Is it more an art, or is it more of a science? And by the way, our um, um, apple pruning expert on this um, project found that it's um, very much a science. Um, one of the ways to distinguish that is that could they, with just a few cuts, right? Because to do robotics, they were uh, pointing out, it has to be as, <laughs> as few uh, uh, motions from the robot as possible to really make it work. And they found that they could, with just three cuts, uh, they could prune an apple tree um, very effectively and uh, that they could also prune it uh, better than any individual person working on it. So um, that's, that's what their claim was anyway. I'm not, uh, I don't recall exactly how they measured it, but basically uh, they were finding that uh, it is mostly an art and, or mostly a science and not an art. But we kept this question in the survey because we wanted to get a sense of if farmers' perspectives on the value of, of uh, manual pruning would somehow influence their perspective. Next slide, please. So uh, some other things was, you know, how important is manual labor for harvesting, uh, you know, from high importance to low importance. Um, 
uh, how important it is for dormant pruning, and then also um, th that art science uh, consideration. Next slide, please. So then uh, just to very quickly to run through a, uh, our logistic model here, um, we included a number of these and the, the main outcome variable we used was, I would consider buying an automated pruner if the machine could do similar quality work for the same cost or less than hand labor. And it was very simple, yes or no. Uh, so that's our um, you know, dummy variable that we use as the outcome variable. Which of these uh, variables would help us um, somehow understand the likelihood that someone would say, I would uh, choose this, uh, this robotic pruner if, if these conditions are met. Next slide, please. So what we found was, uh, again, if you go recall back to that bivariate analysis, um, the, the annual gross revenue and then the, uh, the number of seasonal employees and the importance of manual labor were the key uh, determinants of interest. But you notice that the mid-level, right? It's the, uh, those in the 100,000 to 249,000 are more interested than others. It's the those who have 11 to 20 uh, seasonal employees, not more than 20 and not less than 11. And uh, you know, it's those who who consider manual labor to be of moderate importance. All right, next slide, please. So yeah, our basic finding is that these growers are interested in the robotic pruner if it is the same or lower cost than hand labor when. Producers with an annual gross revenue between 100 and 250. Uh, so they're the ones more likely than those with more or less profitable, pr profitable producers. And again, if you recall back to uh, the way um, some of the growers were describing it to us in our qualitative interviews, they're the ones competing for that labor with the larger growers who can pay more or who have more uh, stable workforces and so forth. So what we found is, yeah, it's those more middle range growers. And the same with the seasonal employees, uh, those with kind of a middle level of uh, seasonal employees are the ones most likely to be interested in, in the automated pruner. Um, and uh, yeah, so it kind of related to this issue of the whole production process is, uh, what we began to see here. Okay, next slide, please. So basic summary here is we mostly confirm, uh, we believe what uh, Bill Friedland had uh, laid out in, the in his early 1980s work is that technology adoption isn't inevitable. It was, and it's not equally appealing to all growers. And it's not just attitudinal. In fact, the attitudinal issues really had um, very little uh, influence, if any. Uh, they had some in the bivariate, but they didn't uh, hold up in the logistic regression. Um, basically, that interest in automation varied by economic structure and by labor needs and availability. Uh, one of the earlier speakers was talking about um, you know, the, the decline in uh, Mexican labor in California. We heard about this often from the, uh, the growers in Washington and in California, especially how they, they bemoan the fact that um, the border control was becoming stricter, you know, just uh, <laughs> quite the contrary to what our political discourse is saying. Um, it's harder to cross the border now than it used to be. And they bemoan the, uh, um, fact that it used to be easy for um, for people to cross the border back and forth. And they said what would happen would be some of the farmers from Mexico would come across the border, um, work in their fields, and then go back and harvest their own crops back in Mexico. So they were getting uh, these farmers going back and forth and how they wished that that was still the case. Um, and another uh, finding is that relationships are not linear in terms of size and scale of operation, right? It was the middle range that was uh, more interested. Uh, and it, it was more about seasonal laborers versus um, um, yeah, long-term uh, or uh, year-round uh, workers. Um, and the location of the operation didn't seem to matter. Next slide, please. So, uh, but uh, although that was this empirical study um, 
that I was part of, and I think it shows some of the complexity of how these technologies are evaluated by growers and, and others. I also wanna talk about uh, a, a new study that I'm a part of, uh, this is in Australia. Um, the PIs on the project are Robert Sparrow, Christopher Mays, and Chris uh, DeGaling. And um, they've uh, brought me on as a consultant on their, on their project um, that was funded by the, the Australian government. And part of their project grew out of this um, pruning uh, technology uh, project that I was, uh, that I just described to you. And however, they're doing, taking a slightly different approach. They're looking at this more broadly than just growers and workers. They're looking at community wide uh, impacts that some of these technologies uh, present. Uh, their plan is to use uh, citizen juries uh, for those of you not familiar with how citizen juries work is you bring together a group of people as if they're a jury for a trial and you present uh, competing evidence uh, for and against and whatever and then see how uh, the citizens uh, interpret, make sense of uh, the opportunities, the risks, the benefits and so forth. Um, so they wanna ask what are the social and ethical issues um, that stakeholders anticipate from the applications of AI and robotics in agriculture. They also wanna look at some of the ethical issues that are raised by the applications of AI and robotics in agriculture. And furthermore, what do farmers, consumers, and rural cons communities, as those like most affected by these technologies, what do they want from AI and robotics when it comes to the, the use of those technologies in agriculture, right? So they're trying to get a much broader perspective of how to think about these, uh, the introduction of these new technologies. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, Sparrow and Howard are part of that project too. And they have this article that lays out some of these ethical concerns. And so I just wanna highlight a few of them. So one is, will it become another barrier to entry for small farmers, right? If AI and robotics uh, create um, higher costs uh, for small growers to get into uh, to farming. Um, will it empower capital at the expense of labor? Um, also, will uh, since work is an important part of contributive justice, will eliminating work lead to socially disengaged people? And we often hear how um, you know, automation or some sort of disruption in, uh, in production uh, will lead to some unemployment. And then there, through training and uh, education, we can uh, get them ready to take on new jobs. But what that overlooks is that disruption can be quite painful for families and communities at, during that time of transition. And uh, furthermore, the work that we do has a big part of influencing how we see ourselves in relation to our society, right? That's the contributive justice part. It's not, uh, ethics often uh, discusses dis distributive um, justice. How are the risks and benefits uh, distributed? Contributive justice implies, how am I contributing to my society? And this is where some of the social safety net issues don't take into consideration. Okay, I might be given some um, unemployment insurance or other kinds of things that can help me make the transition. But in the meantime, I am not working for my society. I'm not contributing to my society. And these are also important issues to consider. Uh, and then furthermore, um, with the increase of AI and robotics, does this make the technology more susceptible to hacking, sabotage, and other security risks? And I don't know that there's an answer for this yet, but it's something we need to consider. Next uh, slide, please. Um, so furthermore, uh, the Sparrow and Howard, uh, Howard our, um, paper examine how some of the contradictions in these claims because the United Nations Food and Ag Organization claim that to, to feed uh, this growing world, uh, what we really need is poverty reduction, biodiversity protection, and climate change mitigation. And they argue that automation and AI are most often associated with the exact opposite of those things, right? Industrialization, standardization, and monocultures. 
um, since in order for some of these robotics to work, you need um, homogenized um, apple or grape or other fruit um, trees. So in other words, yeah, they say it's the exact opposite. So what's needed is thoughtful policy is what they're arguing. But we're not seeing evidence of these thoughtful policies yet. Anything taking really seriously what those things are. Next slide, please. I think this is the final slide. So a uh, couple more slides. Um, will AI and automation unfold in a matter that maximizes, maximizes benefits for small farmers or for small workers, or will it maximize benefits for uh, the larger and the, the capital intensive? Um, will it increase engagement? Will it provide resilience to security risks? These are, I think, relevant questions um, that we need to address. Next slide, please. This is just a very simple um, analysis of how um, the benefits of productivity have been distributed um, since um, basically right around the uh, end of World War II. We saw as productivity mostly related to technological adoption, right? Workers became more productive. Uh, wages and productivity tended to go together. After 1980 or so, there was a gap and um, productivity did not necessarily lead uh, to uh, higher uh, wages for workers. And if you look at that slide, you'll, you'll begin to perhaps understand why not all workers are eager uh, to adopt new technologies. Um, you know, I was, uh, I grew up on a farm in southeastern Minnesota. I worked on um, a lot of dairy farms. I pulled weeds and bean fields over the summers and so forth. Those jobs, you know, I didn't exactly like those jobs, but I made money doing it. And I would have probably not gotten through uh, college uh, with the little amount of debt that I had if I hadn't worked those jobs. And so, you know, the introduction of uh, glyphosate resistant uh, soybeans ended my job as a weed picker in, in, in the soybean fields. Um, you know, maybe that's for the better. It wasn't a pleasant job, but again, I made money on it and I felt like I was part of something. So these are important questions. Next slide, please. So yeah, final slide here, policy issues. Public policies and other institutional factors will shape the future research and technological development. Are we gonna be engaged in those policies to make sure that they have benefits for everyone? Uh, public policies and uh, will, will shape the distribution of risks and benefits. Can we create policy, policies that incentivize the pursuit of the public interest over the private interest? And can they amplify labor interests over capital interests? Um, and next slide, please. And I think that's it. Yes. Any questions, uh, feel free to send me an email if you don't have any questions or if we don't have the time right now. There was, I was interested in the results that you didn't find differences across the locations. I would, ex I would have expected differences based on types of farms and, uh, and differences in minimum wages and things like that. Were all those variables covered? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think we captured that in the size and scale of the farms. Um, but the, the, the geographic, we did not find um, differences across uh, geography. Uh, we did in other things. Uh, for instance, we, uh, we measured uh, concern about climate change. And there was absolute uh, difference between Washington and California growers compared to Pennsylvania and New York growers in terms of concern about climate change. But as far as the interest in pruning, we did not find a geographic difference. Interesting. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. David Silverman. This is a fascinating uh, study. Uh, I have two questions. Why are you surprised that uh, you have a heterogeneity and attitude uh, to technology? I don't expect that most people uh, will be interested in the technology. Any marketer knows that there is a small people that will be interested in the technology and the technology is the option. It may be if you develop a technology 
may not be used for 20 years. It may be yeah. used tomorrow. So to some extent, I think there is a separate between what, the, what you do as a research institution and the economic reality and the policy. So I, I agree. I, so my feeling is if we can separate it, either that there is a supply chain and then there is a policy, then we have some sort of a connection. So to some extent, it done, the implication is not that you don't need to do research, but rather that you have to recognize who will benefit from it. And yeah. then it's the role of a policymaker, whoever, or the public in the democracy to decide about policies that make it, uh, uh, make it feasible. So I really think that this really is important because the, because I because I really love the research, but the implication is not don't do risk, uh, don't develop new technology, have more sound policy, think about the social implication of policies, develop a mechanism to to adjust uh, to to help people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah. I think altogether, I don't think there is a big difference between economists and sociologists. And I really love this talk because I think it can really lead to multidisciplinary dialogue. Uh, I agree with you, uh, David. Uh, I don't see a big difference between institutional economists and sociologists. Uh, neoclassical, I do. Uh, but I think you're, uh, you know, and I, I, if I didn't convey this adequately, then I, I, I failed in my presentation. But what did surprise me was that the middle range growers were more interested than the larger growers. I really thought we would see some sort of linear progression that the larger farmers would have the greater capital uh, capacity and so forth. That's where uh, my surprise, I did not expect the smaller growers to have uh, as much interest. Um, so to that end, but yes, I think the, uh, the policy implications are where, um, you know, where, where the rubber hits the road, so to speak question. It's an online question. It's from John Reed, and he asks, have, have there been studies to consider augmenting labor with automation tech that assists in, ta in tasks like pruning in a way to make existing labor productive versus robots replacing re labor? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not aware of such things. Um, I am doing some work in, um, uh, in northern Ghana right now on peanut production. And uh, it's one of the things we're looking at is labor enhancing technologies as opposed to labor saving technologies. And the question that uh, Mr. Reed asks uh, in some ways gets at that, but I'm not aware of anything uh, of that nature in the United States. It may be happening. Uh, I'm just not aware of it and I haven't done it myself. Our next speaker is Diane Charlton from Montana State University, uh, Department of Agricultural and Resource Econ or Agricultural Economics and Economics. And uh, Diane's uh, research interests are at the intersection of labor, mar labor markets, labor, immigration, agricultural production, and development in economics. Welcome, Diane. Well, thank you and thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the presentations this morning and I, I think there's a lot of intersections with um, some of the things that I was planning on saying today. So um, hopefully we'll tie some of these pieces together. Um, I wanna start by, by just creating the, the landscape of, of where we came from and, and where we are today in terms of uh, the US workforce. So if we go back to 1900, 40% of the US population lived on farms and 60% in rural areas. Today, less than 1% live on farms and just 14% in rural areas. And so this beckons the question, if so much of the US workforce has transitioned out of agricultural work, how have we continued to produce um, many labor intensive agricultural crops? And um, of course, uh, the this answer lies uh, largely in immigration. So uh, this is the US crop workforce in 2016, according to the National Agricultural Workers Survey, um, which excludes H-2A guest workers. Um, so if we were to include H-2A in here, the foreign born population would be even larger. H-2A is roughly 10% of the full-time equivalent crop workforce. So um, 
So more than 65% of US crop workforce is from Mexico, less than 26% um, are actually US born. And I also want to note that the United States is not alone in bringing workers from other countries to work uh, on, on our farms. Uh, around the world, more developed countries that have already transitioned out of farm work bring in guest workers from other countries. Um, think of um, South Africa, brings in guest workers from Zimbabwe, Canada, from Mexico, the Caribbean, uh, New Zealand, from other Pacific islands. So the United States is not alone. This, this is a global trend. Um, and the United States has depended primarily on workers from Mexico for, for several decades. However, Mexico is now transitioning out of farm work similar to the way the United States did in the 20th century. So um, this is uh, the results from a study that I, I did with Ed Taylor from UC Davis several years ago. We took household survey data that was nationally representative of rural Mexico, and we measured a trend in the probability of working in agriculture between 1980 and 2010. Um, the survey asked about um, the work histories of everyone in the household, including all children of the household head. So, um, so even if, if children had moved away from the home, we could see whether they were working in agriculture. So whether working in the United States or Mexico, the probability of working in agriculture is decreasing by about 1% per year. So that's about 250,000 people a year moving out of agricultural work. Um, and if we look at every census region of rural Mexico, so even if we, if we look at, at central Mexico here, where the probability of working in agriculture is much higher than say in the northeast of Mexico, we still find a statistically significant negative trend in the probability of working in agriculture. And people always ask me about that little bump around 2007. Um, we were emerging surveys um, with retrospective data, and that is one of the places where we're emerging a couple of surveys. So I think that is probably um, a product of trying to, to merge surveys in our paper. We did several robustness checks to, to convince ourselves that it was uh, a negative trend and not just the result of retrospective data bias. But, um, so Mexicans are, are transitioning out of farm work much as the US workforce did. In addition, uh, the, the crop workforce is becoming less migratory. So there's a really interesting paper by Fan et al. in 2015, where they show that since 1999, 1999, the probability that workers are migratory, crop workers are migratory, has been de declining by quite a lot. So this is in 2016, according to the NAS, only um, or an entire 79% of the crop workforce was located in, in one location. We're not following the, the crop, we're not shuttle migrants. Only 8% actually practiced this follow the crop going from farm to farm, wherever the harvest was. And only 11% were shuttle migrants in which they live in one location and work in another. So the workforce is becoming less migratory. You can imagine from a farmer's perspective, if workers are less migratory, the labor supply is going to be much tighter. So given the seasonality of labor demand, having a less migratory workforce can be problematic. So this, this leads to this question um, that economists have been grappling with for, for several years. Um, you know, what, what will happen in agriculture as the, the immigrant workforce declines and workers become less migratory? How do farmers respond to uh, labor supply shocks? And so um, I just want to review a few studies that have used some quasi experiments to try to understand how agriculture responds to inward shifts in the farm labor supply. So the first one is a paper by Clemens, Lewis and Postal. They uh, looked at the termination of the Bracero program, the guest worker program between Mexico and the United States from World War II to 1964. The program was ended very abruptly in 1964. And so they looked at US counties and uh, looked at how much each county relied on Bracero workers prior to 1964 as uh, sort of this variable of, of how much um, they were affected by the termination of the Bracero program. And they found that the more the county depended on the Bracero program, the more likely they were to uh, increase uh, use of labor saving technologies. And there did tend to be a little bit of a transition out of more uh, labor intensive crops. Uh, a paper by Lou et al. looked at the, the 2008 Legal Arizona Workers Act. This was uh, legislation in Arizona that made it very difficult for unauthorized immigrants 
to work in Arizona, they found that family, family farm labor supply increased in Arizona after law was, um, was implemented. And then there've been several papers that have looked at the impacts of 287G immigration enforcement policies. These are policies that permit the local law enforcement to cooperate with ICE to detect and detain unauthorized workers. And these papers have shown that implementation of 287G policies reduce the low skilled immigrant workforce, reduce agricultural expenditures, farm incomes and vegetable production, reduce total agricultural acreage and increase capital substitution on farms and have increased labor efficiency on dairies but reduced aggregate dairy production and total number of dairy operations. And so um, of course these are limited quasi experiments but they do give us some idea of how agriculture responds to inward shocks to farm labor supply. And overall, we see an increase in adoption of labor saving technologies and a reduction in overall production of, of labor intensive crops and dairy production. Um, most recently, we've been thinking a lot about COVID-19 and um, adjusting our, our lives to that shock. Um, agriculture um, was not excluded. Of course, agricultural work was deemed essential and had to be performed in person. And agricultural activities are also very time sensitive, so potentially very vulnerable to shocks from COVID-19 if workers were to get sick um, and no one was available to harvest crops. Um, I measured the association between month to month variation in historical fruit, vegetable and horticultural employment from April to August 2019 and COVID-19 cases and deaths within US counties in 2020 to see if COVID-19 was increasing within counties the same time that uh, employment in FEH production was expected to increase. And um, just a, a glance at some of these counties that have greater uh, FEH employment in the peak month, which would be July, um, obviously here in Washington, um, a, a lot of FEH employment, as well as California, Arizona, Florida, um, a little bit little Northeast and in Michigan, um, I found that 100 additional workers in historical monthly FEH workforce were associated with 2.27 to 4.54% or COVID-19 cases within U.S. counties. That was 15.78 to 18.65 additional COVID-19 cases per 100,000 individuals in the county and 0 0.21 to 0 0.34 deaths per 100,000. All of these results were significant at the 1% level of confidence. So these were very precise estimates. I do want to emphasize that this is not looking for a causal relationship. This does not mean that um, an increased employment of FEH workers causes COVID-19 to increase. It is merely a, an interesting correlation, but I do think it is an interesting correlation because this does highlight some of the vulnerabilities in the agricultural production that uh, were highlighted during COVID-19 and are still issues right now um, as we, we're still dealing with sickness and how um, the workforce can, can uh, recover. In particular, in this study, I found that employment by farm labor contractors were also positively associated with increased cases of COVID-19 and deaths. And I thought that was also particularly important and interesting because farm labor contractors have historically been uh, one of the methods in which employers can adjust to uh, tight labor supplies by contracting workers through a third party. So if the farm labor contractors are also susceptible, this could create even more challenges for farm employers. <laughs> and so this leads to the question of, of whether this could be a turning point for farm labor management. We've been in this era of tightening farm labor supply for quite a while, and now we have an additional shock, an additional challenge that increases the cost of employment and um, some of the risks and vulnerabilities. Cost of farm labor has been rising for years. Um, so this is the, the real US farm wages um, from 1990 to 2019. We can see that they've been rising steadily consistent with this uh, story of diminishing farm labor supply. And, and so what does that mean for US agriculture? So, uh, so several of the papers that I mentioned previously that use those quasi-natural experiments, um, they saw some uh, movement out of labor-intensive crops 
So will US farms simply convert to less labor intensive crops and will we simply import fruits and vegetables from other countries where labor is more abundant? Now, I, I think there probably will be some movement towards increased imports of fruits and vegetables, but I, I really don't think this is going to be the full solution. I think we will still be a major producers of some very labor intensive crops. Um, I think there is a consumer base that would be willing to pay a little bit more for domestically grown fruits and vegetables. Um, some, this example is a little bit extreme, but I saw in the, in the um, Wall Street Journal a few months ago that um, people will actually pay $50 per package of eight strawberries because these strawberries are supposed to be such high quality. Um, I don't know who buys uh, strawberries for $50 per package of eight. But um, some of those people exist, and I think it just does highlight that there are specialty markets and consumers who are willing to pay a little bit more for a product that they uh, perceive to be of higher quality. So I don't think we will completely convert out of the production of labor intensive fruits and vegetables. So producers are really going to have to look for better um, or other solutions. So one solution would be to try to recruit workers from further abroad. If Mexicans don't want to work in agriculture, maybe we can recruit workers from somewhere else, another country that is not as far along in this development process as Mexico is, and maybe more workers are still working in agriculture. If we try to look a little bit further south, the rural population of Central America is quite a bit less than Mexico. Um, more than 6 million more people live in rural Mexico than in, in rural Central America. And, and furthermore, if we think about recruiting workers from Central America, we would still be competing with Mexico and other Central American countries for that limited supply of labor. Mexico actually has a guest worker program to bring guest workers from Guatemala to work on Mexican farms at the same time that Mexico is exporting uh, farm workers to the United States. We could think about recruiting workers from further abroad. I, I know I've heard Phil Martin talk about recruiting workers from Asia or Africa, where farm labor is still relatively abundant in, in many of those countries. But we have to think about the, the costs and logistics of bringing workers from so far abroad. Um, in Montana, where I live, they actually do bring in H-2A workers from South Africa, but those Afri South Africans are driving combines. So think of the marginal product of labor if you're driving a combine versus hand-picking strawberries. And, and so I think um, that will be a major factor as we think of bringing workers from further abroad. Uh, another solution would be to streamline and expand the H-2A program. Now this doesn't necessarily bring in more workers as workers are transitioning out of farm work, but it, it does maybe help bring in uh, farm workers to the United States as we're competing with Mexican farms for that limited supply of farm workers. Uh, H-2A has been around since 1986 use of H-2A was very low in the first couple of decades of its existence. Um, there's lots of costs associated with H-2A, uh, lots of logistics in terms of filing paperwork with multiple government agencies, uh, paying for uh, housing, for transport from and return to the, the workers' country, and lots of regulations. But despite all these costs, H-2A employment did grow by more than 450% from 2001 to 2019, which I think is indicative of this issue of this diminishing farm labor supply. Even though H-2A is costly, it is a solution to contract guest workers. And um, I like to show this flow chart, not because you can actually read it, but, um, but I downloaded this from the Department of Labor a few years ago. I should check to see that it's actually still up there. But um, this is the H-2A application process. And my favorite part is that when you get to the end here, it says, congratulations, you are ready to file with the USCIS. So, um, so that's what farmers have been dealing with. Um, there have been many efforts to streamline the H-2A program for many years, and none of them have been successful. I'm a little bit optimistic that as the demand for H-2A has increased, um, and there is some bi bipartisan support for some uh, changes, that, that maybe someday we, we will actually improve this program, hopefully to the benefit of workers and employers. Um, there's relatively little research that looks at some of the, the causes of uh, H-2A growth. Um, 
And so this is a paper, this is from a paper that I wrote with my, my co-author Marcelo Castillo from the USDA ERS. And we noticed that H2A applications increased when the, the housing boom was occurring in the early 2000s, decreased a little bit during the housing bust, and then continued to increase again during the recovery. And um, so we plotted that along with construction employment, and we thought that the national trends were pretty interesting. And then we looked at some of the housing literature and we thought, well, I think we could actually causally identify the impacts of housing booms and busts on H2A demand. And so that's what we did. And we found that a 1% increase in housing demand led to a 0.4 to 0.97% increase in H2A employment on average within US community zones from 2001 to 2017. So the story that I think is happening here is that during a housing boom, construction employment increases, employment increases in other industries like landscaping and services, many of the industries that employ immigrants with low levels of education. So if those industries pull workers out of agriculture, then employers might demand more H2A workers who would be contracted specifically to work in agriculture. We also found positive effects of housing booms on um, local farm wages, which is consistent with that story of pulling workers out of agriculture. And so today we see help wanted signs in stores all over the country. And there are all of these options in the non-farm industry. Well, what does that mean for agricultural employers? I expect we'll probably see an increased demand for H2A workers. But even as we look to H2A workers, workers in these sending countries might also have other employment opportunities and may not be as interested in working on US farms. So I, I think this will be an ongoing challenge. And this leads us to technological innovation. So um, as, as David alluded to earlier, the UC tomato harvester is one of the most famous examples of a major technological innovation in, in agriculture in the United States. It was a joint innovation between plant scientist Jack Hanna and engineer Kobe Lorenzen. They had to develop a tomato that ripened uniformly and wouldn't uh, just get smashed when it was uh, harvested by, by the machine. Within three years of this innovation, California's acreage and mechanically harvested tomatoes rose from 3% to 90%. It saves an estimated 19 million man hours per year by 1973. So a huge change for the agricultural industry. Here's um, a photo from uh, UC Davis of, of one of the early uh, harvesters. Um, worker advocates sued the University of California. United Farm Workers was opposed to mechanization. There was picketing outside of UC Davis's professor's offices. And they argued that the UC research benefited agribusiness at the expense of small growers, farm workers, and consumers who might have fewer product choices. And in particular, this argument that it harmed small growers took, uh, took some attention and the University of California lost the lawsuit. And so since then, there's been a lot of reticence to actually invest in labor-saving technologies, as, as David already uh, mentioned. Uh, Schmitz and Seckler, 1970, find that there were positive net returns to the development of the tomato harvester, but some people gained while others lost, so it was not Pareto effect. But that's not where we are today. We're in a much different world today. And if we don't find ways to become more technological in agriculture, uh, we won't be able to compete in the, the global market. So um, Manoj already described a lot of the innovations in robotic harvesters. So I'm, I'm not going to, to repeat that, but there's um, some really great strides in robotics. Um, there's also, um, similar to that tomato harvester where we had the cooperation of plant scientists and engineers, there's also innovations in cultivating new varieties. Um, I, I pulled this article a few years ago because I just liked the creativity of it. I don't know if anybody actually grows the sun cream grape, but um, raisin grapes used to be the most labor intensive crop grown in North America. Um, that was until the 1980s. So originally raisin grapes were harvested. Uh, workers would go through the rows, harvest the grapes, and put them on paper trays between the trellises. 
And then they would have to go back through after the, the grapes had dried in the sun, roll those trellises up, and then take a forklift and pick up those rolls of, of paper trays. In the 1980s, a dry on the vine technology was, was created in which a certain variety of grape, the workers could actually go through and snip the canes. And then the, the grapes would just hang there in clusters and dry on the vine, and then they could be mechanically harvested. This reduced the labor demand dramatically. And then this farmer was very innovative and he bred a grape that will actually naturally dry on the vine without actually having to go through and, and cut the, the grapes. So I don't know if anybody grows sun cream, but it does show the innovation that farmers have in trying to breed new varieties to solve this issue of labor. Um, there's innovations in cultivation practices. Uh, weeds are traditionally removed mechanically between rows and manually within rows, but integrated weed management systems can robotically remove intra-row weeds and reduce hand weeding times by 20 to 40%. And there's also automation in other industries along the food supply chain. So agriculture is not alone. We are seeing health wanted signs uh, in many industries and uh, agriculture is only one of them. But as we move forward, and as we see that mechanization and robotics and uh, precision agriculture are part of our future, uh, I think we really need to think about what kinds of skills farms will require in the future and we need to begin preparing in advance. Well, they need technical, mechanical, data, data analytic skills, and how are we educating the farm workforce of tomorrow? Are the, the students coming through FFA going to be the, the workers who are analyzing these data, or are we going to be bringing in more educated workers from abroad to work on US farms? And how do we prepare for that? So thank you, I appreciate, uh, the what we've discussed in this conference and I'd be happy to take questions. So any questions from Yeah, Chi. Uh, I'm a student from A County Department. Uh, so uh, for the question, like bring further foreign labors, um, like when, when talk about the, the law reasons, is there a, like a specific obstacle uh, could be uh, the reasons that pre pre preventing that from happening? Or uh, is a law from the, ex the labor exporting country or the, like the law, the law in, the, in the US? Oh, Thank in you. terms of preventing workers from actually arriving here in the United States? Yes. So is there like a specific obstacle could be the reason uh, for, for that not happening? So immigration policies can affect labor supply as some of those studies have shown with the, some of the immigration policies that have been implemented at more local levels. We can see that when we make it more difficult for workers, unauthorized workers to enter, then we do have these declines in agricultural production and labor intensive crops. So that is part of the story, but I think we have to think more broadly as well because we're seeing that Mexico where many of our unauthorized workers have come from and an estimated 50% of the, the crop workforce is unauthorized. Um, if, if Mexicans don't want to work in agriculture and Central Americans don't want to work in agriculture, we will have an issue even if we make it really easy for people to come to US farms. So I think that's part of the issue, but I think we have a bigger issue. Yeah, I, I just pretty curious that uh, like from my experience, like uh, because of uh, ag, ag, econ, uh, ag labor using is pretty uh, in a seasonality and, and because uh, the wage uh, when compared to the developing country is pretty high and then so for me, it's a great idea that uh, labor just come here and work in the peak season for a few months. Uh, but I just curious why uh, that couldn't be the, what couldn't happen. Yeah, and well, and I think part of it, I think there are studies and I can't, I can't cite them off the top of my head, but I've heard of, of studies in which, you know, even with the, even if there's a slight change in relative wages, people tend to stay in their home countries more frequently. I think there's just other costs of, of migration. So that might be 
part of the story. I think part of the story too is if people can come and maybe work in agriculture temporarily and then find a non-farm job, um, often agri agriculture is just a springboard to other opportunities. So um, that could be part of the issue as well. H2A has been an effort to try to fill in this gap and thus far H2A has continued to increase. But if Mexicans don't wanna work in agriculture, again, keep coming back to that. Do people want to work in agriculture? But thank you, those are great questions. So I have David and then Douglas. Mm -hmm. I think that the key point is what type of constraint uh, you have on this program. You see that we could continue the Brazil, the Brazil program till this day and from South Africa or, or Taiwan. There is a huge program that Russia had from Vietnam for many, many years. So the key element is that we want to have program that will pay people decent, uh, decent salaries, but they're really difficult on the employees, they're difficult, so, so, so they really become a, so they really become a, a quite a difficult. So, I, so to me, the key element is program design and the parameters of the program design become more and more uh, difficult. So it's demand, supply, and what type of equilibrium you want. And I think that's the reason that uh, we are having a situation that the solution may be, uh, may be automation. Now, the other thing about automation, to what extent there is automation in other countries to do the same thing. Is the automation only American or coming from other countries? Maybe if we don't do it, Europe. Yeah, I think those are, those are excellent points. I think it's always interesting with the H2A program, you know, we have this issue of, or prior to H2A, um, people want to come work in agriculture and springboard onto non-farm jobs. H2A prevents workers from going to the non-farm sector but how do we protect the rights of H2A workers when they might have less of a voice, um, less of ability to leave an employer? So there's lots of issues in that. I think you you raised some interesting issues just by mentioning um, the difficulties with that program. So one of the motivations for this workshop was our, our discussions around the, you know, what do we know about the environmental and economic and social sustainability footprint of the food system? Food supply chain agriculture. And, and as I teach and have studied, you know, the US agricultural system is much to crow about and be excited about. But on a social sustainability footprint, the labor conditions and working conditions are a, a sore point, a point at which we, we don't spend as much thinking and talking. Um, when we look at how um, prior innovation has occurred in agriculture, technological innovation, very little of it has been driven by an impulse of solving that problem, it solves the labor shortfall issues from an employer point of view, but not so much a, how to create an, you know, an employment path. We, and we've talked a lot today about the prospect is there to make really good jobs for which we can train people. What are the economic incentives or what would be required to create a, a different kind of innovation path that rewards the creation of those jobs as part of the technology innovation process, like what Manaj is talking about, what would you have to do as an engineer and an agronomist to front and center the social potential implications or the labor implications as much as the sort of employer or market implications, which I don't think would be rewarded in the status quo. So I guess um, maybe a question in response as this labor supply is getting tighter, don't you think that the workers should theoretically have more, more bargaining power? And, and so I think the market forces are transitioning us to a, an era in which the workers can make greater demands and there will be incentives for employers to create and bring in technologies that make the jobs more comfortable, um, which is the silver lining side of all of this. Um, I, I think we, I remain optimistic that that will be part of the story. Um, time will tell. I'd like to ask the panel to um, join me in the seats on the stage.
So our panel includes uh, Karina Gallardo, who is a professor and extension specialist in the School of Economic Sciences. Uh, she studies consumer preferences for food quality and understanding profitability and other factors affecting grower adoption of new technologies. And um, thankful to, I'm thankful to have her as one of my colleagues. Uh, we have uh, Steve Mantle, who is the founder of Innovate Ag, a Walla Walla based, Washington based um, egg startup and Microsoft partner company prior to embarking on the startup. Steve spent 12 years at Microsoft where he was uh, most recently focused on the fastest growing product line, Azure Cloud. He's Australian by birth and has an MBA from the University of Washington. Uh, we, are al we also have Tomas Madrigal. He is the son of farm workers and a large uh, migrant family who settled in the lower Yakima Valley. Uh, he is a food systems researcher and an equity and social justice consultant. And he holds a PhD in, um, Mex in, with specialization in Mexican labor and development of US agriculture. And he shapes policy at the state level and is a member of a number of, a number of task force. And then uh, the, the last person, uh, we were supposed to have Ines um, Hanrahan, but she, but she became sick. And so she, uh, she asked uh, Jeff Cleverina um, to step in, to, in her place. And I'm very thankful that you did at the last moment. And Jeff is the chair of the technology committee for the Washington State um, Tree Fruit Commission. And so with this, uh, with this panel, I'll, I'll, we'll start out by every, each panelist can uh, talk about their perspectives on the issues that we've done, been discussing and think about the problems <clears throat> and challenges and, uh, in, and what, the future, what the future might hold and just take about five minutes each. And then, and then I, I hope that we'll have a discussion both online and, and with the audience. So uh, I would go, uh, maybe we'll start with Karina so that we don't put Jeff on the spot to start. There we go, right. Well, good morning. My name is Karina Gallardo. I'm with the School of Economic Sciences at Washington State University. Happy to be here sharing this table with all of you. Um, my main thoughts are about talk, listening to Manoj talk. I think that uh, from an economics perspective, we have a, three, a four stage task. First is defining the cost benefit of any mechanization or automation adoption, uh, picking rates, efficiency gains, sa sa savings in man hours. What is, where are we there? What are the standards that we are looking at? Picking rate is important. We have a very high standard to, to compete with the machine. So not sure if we are there yet or not. One thing that also, uh, is important here, and this comes from my conversations with the industry, is reliability of the technology. What happens if the technology decides not to work in the middle of the harvest? The apples will, will still mature, be mature and be ripening. They will not work until an engineer comes and solves the problem. So there are many issues that are involved in this cost benefit. Second, and this is from David, and my colleague Jeff Lackstad also agrees with this, Supply chain, what are the uh, uh, factors or what are going to be the impacts in the entire supply chain of adoption uh, of this automatization and mechanization? Are we gonna see uh, initial perhaps decrease in supply because we're seeing more defective fruit or we're going to have a mixture, a decline in the picking rate, a mixture of machine versus labor in the field at the initial, at the initial stages of the adoption? What is going to happen? with the arrangements at the packing house and how the consumers are going to uh, uh, react to this. So supply chain studies, important. Um, the third one is uh, what is going to be the impact on labor? And there has been a lot say, we have the experience of the tomato harvest, 
We don't want workers outside of my NOSH office throwing stones at him. We want to see what is going to be, what is going to be the realistic effect on labor. Is it going to displace labor? What is going to happen? In my opinion, this is, uh, we are not in a perfect equilibrium in the labor market. We are not uh, in the point where supply meets demand of labor. We are experiencing a shortage. And the reason why we don't see the shortage in the fields is because growers are going to H2A. Talking with the industry, it has been said, at least for the state of Washington right now, 60% of harvest labor is perhaps covered by H2A and 40% by local uh, labor force. So effects of automatization of farm labor, important to study. And the least but not, last but not least is who is ready to adopt? We see the work of uh, Milan in Penn State, and he said, yes, we see differences in the scale of the operations. But I will also add the horticultural arrangement of the field, not necessarily large scale, means the orchard is ready to adopt the machine. It is important, Manoj talked about this, we need to have a very strict fruit wall with, uh, with a very strict training so that we make easy for the artificial intelligence the robot to locate the fruit, to uh, avoid the obstacles and to detach from the tree. So uh, freestanding tree, probably not, right? So it needs to be, who, it needs to be a, a tree that is conducive to increase the efficiency of the machine. So having said that, I would just like to mention about Diane's talk uh, on what is happening in the, in the policy perspective, what is going to happen with H2A in the future with this decreasing pools of available labor from our usual uh, partner in supplying labor that is Mexico. What is going to happen to the Farm Workforce Modernization Act that was, I believe it passed in the House, but it's uh, waiting approval in the Senate. Is this going to streamline the H2A? Are they, I think they are lobbying or they want to have like year round H2A availability. Right now, we only can have H2A for short periods of time or def definite periods of time. Having them year long, is this gonna be something positive as Diane mentioned for both the worker and the, and the farm operations? What is going to happen with that? How the industry sees this? And at the end, what is going to be the, the, the role of the land grant universities. And this is just an um, as a anecdotal experience that I had. My institution, WSU, along with the College of Ag and the Washington Department of Ag, we were trying to put, or they were trying to put together, I was just a, a guest there, a, a leadership, agricultural leadership program to try to provide some lacking the skills to fill supervisors, most of them Hispanic, most of them Spanish speaking. As you can tell, I am a Spanish speaker by uh, my, my first language is Spanish. So we were, we were like brainstorming on how to develop a curricula. So we put together soil and crop sciences. We put together entomology, pathology. We were all excited, economics. Yes, let's teach them everything. You know, at the end of the day, there was a Lexi survey and they said, you know what? We are only interested in uh, human resources or management of our crews, how we're going to manage our crews, how we're going to communicate. So what David said is absolutely certain. The need is to how to work with people. And that, that is the need and the, the training, the, pers the new perspectives, it's also very important. Thank you. Matter done school. Good day, um, ask for your permission to speak to you. Um, it's not often that you get a chance to have a conversation. Uh, yesterday and today had an opportunity of engaging and listening to uh, what this group plans to do um, and what they're interested in investing in. And there are a few observations that I want to bring in from the literature, uh, from my field experience, and uh, also from my ethical position, right? Um, farm policy and immigration policy have been 
intimately uh, intimate in shaping the landscape for the development of agriculture in the last century. I think a lot of the previous presenters uh, provided examples of just how that has occurred. Uh, with each historical mechanization, modernization, and automation in agriculture uh, that were made in order to try to resolve the limits of capitalist development or the industrialization of agriculture, new problems have always arisen and violence against workers in particular has plagued the industry. Riot, um, massacres, like um, premature deaths. Um, during my dissertation here in Washington, the most common activity that I witnessed uh, were funerals uh, for farm workers that were maybe 50 years old or younger um, that died from workplace in injuries or chronic disease. Um, the industrialization of agriculture is unsustainable. It has been uns unsustainable. And it relies primarily on the federal subsidization it receives in order to survive. This has led to a move away from any intervention that's really seeking to overcome the limits of agriculture and instead seeks to maintain the high level of public subsidy for private agricultural enterprises as evidenced by the Union of Agricultural and immigration policy that I just mentioned here in the United States over the last century. At the turn of the 20th century, as now, the reluctance of farm policy makers to implement equity in rural society as part of their development of industrial agriculture has resulted in the continued estrangement, I'm quoting, estrangement, depersonalization, and impoverishment, unquote of rural society. This includes small farmers and farm laborers and their rural families. And this was Walter Goldschmidt uh, writing in 1947 that many of you probably have read. The United States has failed to extend equal protections to agricultural workers as those that are enjoyed by other industrialized workers, creating a distinct labor system that is different and unequal over the past century. The intensification, mechanization, modernization, and proposed um, automation of industrial agriculture has resulted over the past century in creating a skilled agricultural working class without the accompaniment of professionalization as demonstrated in that graphic of production continuing to go way up and wages um, uh, declining. Those closest to the problem are the closest to the actual solution that can save us. And those workshops like, the, uh, like this continue to push forward failed farm policy precisely because small farmers and agricultural workers are not at the decision-making table of what investments are going to be made, and what solutions are going to be chosen. Um, and then just a reflection on some of uh, the points made today when there was a call to invest in land-grant institutions um, uh, for both robotics um, development and uh, for re-education, uh, I just want to provide the warning that we've learned is that starting at the university level is too late. Retraining and education needs to begin early. The ways that we are doing this and in our community is teaching youth to code, for example, and to participate in making their own products. And the solutions that they come up with are completely different than the types of solutions that are coming from people that don't have that creativity. And so um, we are doing this. Automation is here. We know that it's here. Uh, these are some of the observations that I've made and that I offer today. Thank you. Hi, Steve Mantle, um, Innovate Ag. So um, I think I'll just call out some themes, really interesting 
fascinating actually hearing uh, the takeaways from the speakers this morning and trends. Um, my takeaways sort of aligning with, um, with, with this morning are, we're generally seeing from, from our observation as a, as a startup, an ag, ag tech startup, a lot of consolidation to larger farms, right? That's a trend that was called out. With that also is institutional ownership that's driving a lot of that, basically your hedge funds, your pension funds, and so on and so forth. Now, it's not exclusively that. You have some of your larger family-owned growers that are growers that are in that mix as well. But as you bring in, let's say, these um, more financial um, driven, driven is probably not the right word, but um, entities that have a high level of acumen when it comes to financial analysis. They're used to looking at dashboards, right, on what performance KPIs are and so on and so forth. Um, there is increasingly a push then from that ownership down to management um, of these farms to speak in those same terms. And there's this disconnect where now you've got your tiers of ownership, management, team leads effectively, and then your frontline workers. And it becomes harder and harder to communicate um, quantitatively, if you will, in terms of um, what's improving, what needs to be improved, how is that shifting over time. Um, however, this, I think, shifting of, of, of ownership is pushing or pulling adoption of data-driven solutions. And it's about finding, to your earlier points, how do we help equip um, that frontline, that mid-tier and management with the ability to, to um, talk and be conversant around uh, data for making decisions. So um, one of those I, I think is um, very much embracing the next generation that's coming in, um, down at the high school and even down at the elementary level, um, helping them take you know, their phones and ultimately how do they relate to the real world of food production and how can it be more exciting to them and more relevant to them. Um, one aspect of that is, and I think across all of those different persona types that I talked about is uh, being able to have each of those personas relate to um, what needs to be done and also be able to feed back into um, how to improve the system. Um, a component of that is virtual reality and augmented reality. And I, I think the challenge coming from a number of years in high tech uh, at Microsoft, um, it's having augmented reality out in uh, field is not something that's going to happen anytime in the short to, to midterm, maybe five years plus out, but you've got a lot of different things that are in the way, including connectivity challenges out here where it's really spotty up and down, very expensive uh, glasses and so on. But I do believe that is starting to shift. Um, I was looking for my um, Ray-Bans that I have. I noticed you're wearing Ray-Bans, but Ray-Bans that I picked up at Sunglass Hut a couple of weeks ago. Um, these are a cheap prop that I brought instead. And for around $300, I bought a set of Ray-Bans that have two cameras on the front and they have um, two speakers um, that are right beside the ears and has a microphone and I could basically um, make recordings, um, listen to different music, for instance. Um, and the point being is, let's pull back and think about how can we meet that front line in a way that is easy and affordable for, for rolling out. And so an example of that would be to take this complex set of data is hard to really pull apart in terms of what you do with it. And for instance, if it's pruning or picking um, or, or thinning, perhaps changing the music that is playing above somebody's ear, 
in terms of the cadence of that. This is not a novel. I picked this up from, from somebody on the call a while ago thinking along these lines, right? Music is something that we can all relate to. It doesn't matter what your language or what your uh, education is. And so it's finding some of these different ways to bridge that divide where we can bring together data in a way that is relatable. For some growers, they literally are looking for us as reports as a service. So we have to hand them a piece of paper that has a map. Map is also something that everybody can relate to with three or four different colors. You have to incorporate whether people are colorblind, which I seem to be increasingly going down the route of as I age. So um, meeting them where they are. I think um, a couple more things to add in there. Um, around the, the new generation that we see that are, are in college or coming out of college, I am floored. When we post a data science role for our company, an internship role, and we even put, hey, you must be at least studying for your master's and you must not require a visa and this, that, and the other. We have hundreds of applications come in. I'm just blown away. Now, if I put with a very similar job description, a marketing person and a, a finance person, I might get three applications for that. And so there's this thirst. And the thirst often around these folks is it's around how can they make a difference um, around sustainability, around challenges in the workforce. Um, how can they just really roll their sleeves up and be part of the solution? And so I think uh, my takeaway really is, yes, we need to workforce upskill. Um, we need to bring together cross-function collaboration and push on that more. And I think we, as I say to some of these hedge funds and pension funds and so on, as they're in looking at making different acquisitions, when I was at Microsoft, part of what I did was mergers and acquisitions for a few years. And so we would take small companies and we would bring them into this huge company. And you've got this disconnect between a small startup's um, culture and how they compensate and all the things that they stand for that why that person ended up working for that startup and then it, they get pulled into this large company that the antidote to or, or the way to help make them successful we found over and over and over was having ownership and management lean in on culture on having that be open on um encouraging the front line the middle line to, to collaborate together that every it's okay to fail along the way, um, to lean in more heavily on incentives, um, where there's a 20%, you know, I'm just making that number up, but say a 20% bonus, a significant bonus, not $100 here and there, of their compensation for really leaning in on adopting or pushing on technology to help augment things. And then of course, there's the training piece. Okay. Uh, Mine's on now, is it working? Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm Jeff Cleveringa, filling in for Inez. Um, one of the hats I wear is uh, I'm a uh, commissioner on the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission. It was started a little over 50 years ago, uh, taxed uh, a self-imposed tax by the growers <laughs> in the state to fund research. Um, one of the things in 1969 when we were formed was to help us uh, solve some of the labor issues that we were seeing in tree fruit. And here we are 50 some years later, and we're, we're having a conference now on labor. So apparently it took us a long time and we still aren't there yet. So um, while it, uh, it's a goal, it's, uh, there's still a lot of labor involved in, in specialty crops for sure. One of the things I think that um, we need to all, we keep in mind is that rural has kind of become like a a lower class, like oh, you're from the rural area. And really that's where the food is grown. And I think that the population needs to realize that rural is where the food is grown and none of us can survive without food. We can survive without a lot of things, but none of us can survive without food, clothing and shelter and water. So it should be an honor and a badge of courage to be from rural America. As we saw um, with Diane's presentation, we've got about 14% of us are now rural Americans. And so that number, and I'm sure that number shrinks probably every time a statistic is done as we keep getting population movement. Um, and so I, I think that what we're seeing as an industry as well is 
the labor force, people that want to move from the city to the rural to do agricultural jobs is pretty non-existent. Now there are some, uh, we can do some remote type of business type things that we've all learned through COVID, but really if you want the hands-on, we need to recruit from the rural area because those are the people who already know that it's in their blood, it's in their genes, they, they, they know rural America. So some of the things we're doing is uh, going to schools, giving presentations, talking about agriculture. So what the, the mindset of agriculture isn't what your dad and grandparents used to do, long hours working in the dirt with a shovel or a hoe, pulling weeds, those kind of things. We need people in rural America, students, to understand that it's about technology, it's about data analytics, it's about autonomous tractors, it's these kind of things that are coming to us at a really high rate of speed, it's sensors, it's all those things. We need these groups to go out, get a good education, wherever you would choose, and then come back to agriculture because you understand it. Um, I have a friend in California and he has a, a, a fantastic saying, and I, I quote a lot, but Farmers need military grade products at farm pricing and people don't realize that. And, and I, and being on the commission and being involved with technology, I get companies that come all the time and they're like, we're here to solve this. And in a lab, what they did sounds great and looks great. And you put it in the dirt and in a hot environment and it just literally just melts and you just watch it and you just watch their dreams just get crushed because they didn't understand the difference between a laboratory setting and a true real world setting out in rural. And so um, I think that's part of, part of it is that we just, we need to let people know. I think this training, retraining, all these things are all super important. Um, we, we're very dependent on guest workers. And a lot of that is because we don't have that work supply. People are, when, when we talk about migrant workers and those things, that number just diminishes over time. And, and we've all been, um, uh, involved in that. And so wages have gone up. We're paying more and more and more every year for uh, farm workers. The last two years, I think our wages have gone up uh, almost 15%. So it's a dramatic increase. And the other thing, farmers tend to be price takers and not price setters. And so that's one thing too, that maybe farmers can get better at, but again, we're back to this. So you grow the crop in the rural areas, but you need the consumers, you need the people. And when you're not near them, the, the, geogra the geography of marketing those products and the movement of those products becomes overwhelming for farmers who want to just grow the product and do the best they can with what they're good at. And so there is some logistics and supply chain things that, that work against farmers. And so I think there's, there's, yeah, I'll go ahead and we can turn it over to questions and, and go from there. But, and I do represent industry as well. So I uh, work for a company. We're based out of Wenatchee, Washington. It's a family owned uh, orchard company. We raise apples and cherries throughout Washington state. And then we pack and market apples and cherries and pears for uh, growers here in Washington as well. And then my family, we farm too. So we I wear a lot of different hats. So hopefully, uh, Take it easy. On well, thank you. Thank you all those great statements from all of you. Uh, I want to open it up to questions from the audience. John. Thanks, Jill. John McNamara from the board. I want to do a quick quote from a fellow that probably none of you know, John Black in Australia, who spent 30 years building up their industry. I went over there to consult the first time about 15 years ago on this issue on robotics and dairy. <clears throat> and he said, John, those jobs are demeaning, dangerous, and degrading. Humans shouldn't be doing them. We should be better at that. And we've touched on it here this morning. You know, what do you do with the labor you displace? What about, you know, wages? So I'd like to kind of make a comment and then a, a, a question for you. We're, we're, the board and, and land grants are used to doing the research and the technology kind of thing. We're not labor managers, we're not human resource people, okay, in that sense. <clears throat> but the pandemic has given us an opportunity for change here. So I'd like to hear, what are a couple of next steps that, that aren't 
technical, okay, that there are societal steps that you would like to see to help to totally change the paradigm about labor, labor capital in agriculture and food production. Well, we heard a lot of presenters speak to the problem of policy. Um, and one of the things that I think would be very influential is divorcing immigration policy from farm policy. And the Farm Worker Modernization Act is the most recent example of that marriage that would need to be dissolved in order to uh, revolutionize the system. Uh, my name is Qin Lang, uh, director for the Center for Precision and the Ag, uh, uh, Automated Ag Systems. And uh, uh, it's very good to uh, you know, have this opportunity to uh, hear all the presentations. And then I also had uh, quite a few years working in the automation side or robotic mechanization side for the agriculture. So I do learn quite a lot in the past 20, 30 years, but I do have a few questions for the uh, panelists. First of all, you know, the ag, uh, automation or mechanization or robotization is not a new technology. Okay, it has been developed for more than 50 years, just like uh, uh, in a, uh, 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 s said earlier. But uh, still today is not quite yet adopted yet. And uh, why is that? Okay. And as, so, uh, you know, for me, I'm a work on the academic side more, so doing research most of the, um, my time. But uh, how to best integrate with the university research and uh, the industry need? So, this is more for the technology push and the uh, market pulling, and how to integrate that. I think this is a skill. A challenge, and I would like to hear from the industry point of view to see what would be best way to do this. Because I have a lot of experiences on fails. Okay, we developed quite a lot of uh, robotic solutions, but uh, only field can really move into you know for practice. And uh, what is missing? There? Okay, so I think this is uh, something I think. Is a big challenge in front of us. I believe it's not only in the universal research, but also in the industry. So I would like to hear uh, something from the panel. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I, I'll try to address. There was a lot of things in there. Um, I think some of the things um, about adoption are reliability, repeatability, those kind of things in automation. So the, the uh, Karina uh, said earlier in her presentation, what happens when the robot breaks down? Well, if it's harvest, um, our industry is a 12 month industry, but harvest only occurs for 80 days of that 12 months. The rest of it is packing and shipping and supplying consumers with apples, let's say. So the whole thing falls apart if the fruit doesn't get harvested. So if we're talking harvest automation, it's gotta be really good, it's gotta be reliable and repeatable and it can do it every single day if you're gonna not have workers show up for that. So I think that's part of it. Some of the other parts, um, when you talk vision systems, I think you're really, uh, the processing speed of vision has really only maybe in the last five to seven years um, got to the speed where it could be usable. Um, where it's near instantaneous. So I think that's part of it too. Like we can't run a robot through, make all the decisions and then tomorrow go execute those while the data is being processed at night. Um, that doesn't work. So it, it needs to be near real time. And I think that's, you'll see adoption increase as technology becomes cheaper. That's the other part of the equation is cost. So growers only have a certain margin that they can work within um, to make a living and to then be able to hire those people and to do the tasks again the following year. So uh, economics are a big driver of things as well. 
I don't know. That, yeah, economic is critical. Um, I, I think from a adoption perspective, it, it just has to be made easier. It has to be made easier for ag tech slash innovation um, to really understand to Jeff's earlier point around, hey, get out of the lab, get into kind of the real world. And the Tree Fruit Research Commission has done some great work on getting a smart orchard project and, and some other projects that are going that are lab-like, real world lab-like. Um, however, I think more is need, needs to be done there that's, that's kind of repeatable as a, as, as a go-to as opposed to just on a, a one-off repeatable grant basis where there's call it an institute or, or a center for innovation um, adoption type of thing. It's, it's a honeypot, if you will, where you can bring that together and you've got a horticulture. So you've got all the, the persona types that we talked about um, that represent different levels of um, personas within an orchard. Um, or I know we're not talking just about orchards, but in, within a farm. Um, and, and real world experience, basically. Um, so that's what I've got on top of that. Uh, yes, I was thinking about uh, where are we there with the actually fruit, Jeff, Steve, do you think that is it possible to have a new variety or a new cultivar of say apples that will be more easy to work with the machine, like easier to detach, ripening uniformly, um, be able to predict where, where is it going to grow so that the, the robot can uh, detect it less prone to bruising, things like that. Do you think that is also something that we're missing? With the tomato harvester, there was a new variety of tomato that was developed. What do you think? Do we need that new variety of apple? Sure, that would be great. And it needs to taste really good too, right? Because exactly. we want that consumer to not buy it once, but twice. So I think that's the other part <clears throat> of the equation is it's, it's got to eat really well. Um, I think that the, the Washington State breeding program, I think there's some of those things in mind, but that takes a long time when, we, when we're not talking biotech. So when we leave biotech out and we go to natural breeding and we cross and then we, we gather seeds and it's a very, very long process. And so we can use biotechnology to weed out some of the characteristics we don't like um, just by testing for them. But when we're not using biotechnology in a, an actively in a breeding program, um, I, it just, the process just becomes slower. So. Yeah. Uh, well, I would still have one thing to follow, you know, just like Jeff and Steve said, you know, uh, for technology, robustness, you know, reliability is a critical issue, but the issue here is, you know, when we develop a technology, we know normally it takes many steps from the concept to, uh, usable technology and uh, uh, it takes time okay and uh, uh, you know non-product will be just with design that and it will be reliable and uh, and robust and you know uh, very fast but uh, in this process you know just i said earlier it's a push and a pulling process and uh, is there any way could we create a mechanism so the growth the end users could be actively involved in speed of this process. And is there any you know, thought or thinking or should we pursue more in this field? Well, I think when you're talking about industry partnering with uh, research and researchers and new technology and stuff, I think that that's one of the roles that we as the commission are trying to take. Um, Sometimes we're matchmakers and sometimes we're dream crushers at the same time. So um, we get companies that come to us and say, I'm going to develop this vision system and we're going to do X, Y, Z, and it's going to be the best thing ever. And we're like, then you don't need us because we've already spent all the money to do that. And this company here has that figured out. We're not going to fund you to reinvent the wheel. So we do a little dream crushing at times, but we try to be a matchmaker and we would say, we would rather you partner with them and license their technology than we pay to reinvent the technology. So 
I think we're trying to partner with industry, both public and private industry as well, um, to accomplish those things. We try to put them in touch with real growers and real orchard settings when they want to vet their technology and those things. So I think we're trying to be the best matchmaker we can. And as an industry, we each have our own little trade secrets, if you want to call them that. Every industry does things that you don't share with your competition. But a lot of this technology stuff, like companies are, are floored when they come to me and I take them around to six of my competitors and we sit down and chat with them about how the technology benefits all of us as an industry, not just me first. It's, it's all of us because when we have more pull as an industry than I do as a company. So we're, we're working towards that. It's definitely a goal. Um, I'm Amy Ando. I'm a member of the board, and this is a great panel. Thank you all. Um, I particularly appreciated Tomas's comments. I think we needed to hear that. Uh, this afternoon, the board is going to be talking about <coughs> what does a paradigm, a, a new paradigm for agriculture look like? And I think a new paradigm needs to be centered on equity, um, which our current and historical systems certainly have not been. So my question for you all is, what would that look like? Or what would be some steps towards that? Um, some things that are tangible and feasible, <laughs> at least eventually. Um, so I'm curious what ideas you have. Adding to that last exchange, what you're missing is a brain. And so the, the bottom line for a lot of this uh, development in robotics has been to eliminate workers. And that's going about agriculture backwards because there's millennial knowledge in some of these uh, agricultural workers and their ability not just to make decisions around like, you know, the, the, the fruit that they're picking, whether it's ready, but also um, solutions are brought from that tradition. And so um, examples of the technological innovations that farm workers are bringing um, to the table to the different places that they work, for example, shellfish harvesters uh, get a, uh, like a, a fork uh, that people use for uh, taking hay, take it to a metalsmith and create a claw. And it helps them to be able to dig more clams up uh, when they're harvesting clams. Um, similarly, um, in the thinning of apples, um, the, uh, I guess your index and thumb finger that you're, that you're using get really raw. And so they keep trying to find different ways, whether it's using condoms or using mantles from uh, candles. Um, people are, 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 but there's never been an investment in supporting the creation of technological low tech, um, you know, PPE equipment. And we have had about 25 different farm worker uprisings since 2013 here in Washington state. And almost every single one of them had to do with some breakdown in a technological advancement, whether it was a new checking machine to calculate piece rates, or whether it was not having the right uh, protection when you're harvesting uh, daffodils and, and getting uh, skin injuries from that, or, uh, getting pesticides in your, you name it. Like, and so it's not always about the wage, but it's, it, it tends to be these kinds of problems. Um, and so I, I think that's what's been missing in your conversations. You haven't had the opportunity to learn from people that are directly engaged in maintaining agriculture at the level that it's experienced. The success is not because of entrepreneurship or um, you know, a capitalist planner <laughs> figuring things out. The success is at the, at the local level, at the, at the most closest level of how a worker interacts uh, with the na natural environment and, and their, their ability to to bring in that ancestral knowledge um, in how they cultivate these crops. And so um, I, I, I'll go ahead and see to the other folks about what the future might look like for you. 
I mean, I'd, I'd add further to, to build upon your point is it's a bit around culture and that should include H2A workers, given that there's, it's such a prevalent source of labor. And um, where I referenced earlier on, on incentives and so on, but to your point on, on grain, if you can put all the incentives and such in place, unless there's um, a, a catalyst. And so I'm just thinking out loud that perhaps it's uh, having somebody, whether it's within the H2A uh, group or somebody at the, um, the grower team lead level, that has a mandate and has a, a, a remit around adoption of technologies, whether that be as simple as something along, you know, using something different on, on your hands to um, you know, using your phone to be able to communicate on different things and, and close the loop. So it's what I, I think we need is that some catalysts and some po people that are equipped to be able to think on how to adopt and to be able to take, uh, synthesize uh, the broader set of perspectives of folk among them that perhaps may be generational and, and aren't, they're tired and they're not going to do that. Yes. Well, we're running over time. So I will have one quick question that I can bring to David, but we'll, we'll try to wrap it up. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, everyone. And thank you, Thomas. You just talked about what I wanted to ask because I wanted to ask what are the real efforts about two issues that we have been talking today. The first one, the preservation and the transfer of the really expert knowledge, because we, we uh, I've heard during this day a lot about the decreasing numbers of agricultural labor, which means that we have this uh, expertise going away from where we need it because even though we have apples everywhere, location is super important to the um, the knowledge that they have in the specific location. So what efforts in that one? And the second one, uh, you also talk about more educated labor. If you go in the reality of that, that's not going to happen any soon. So what are the efforts to actually educate the labor to these new opportunities that automation is bringing to them? Is industry going to take the cost of that education? Are universities going to help with extension as well? So I'll just real quick touch on a little bit of that. So education, um, Obviously in rural, rural areas, we are working with schools, high schools mostly, um, talking about futures of agriculture. So that was part of it. And then um, the Apple Education Foundation, which is a big scholarship foundation funded by the industry to give scholarships for those who wanna go on to any sort of continuing uh, schooling. Um, but when we bring technology to the orchards, it doesn't, do us any good if it doesn't meet the real world. So we bring our managers, our crew bosses, those we want them to interact. So we introduce them to the technology provider right away. And then they interact, we take feedback, like we want those because they do, they have a lot of that hands-on knowledge, historic knowledge, all of those things. And it's super important. And it scares us as an industry to watch that age group get older and older and the, the replacement isn't coming. So the next generation of those who want to do some of this and be decision makers is dwindling. And so we're trying to incentivize financially, educationally, scholarship wise, all the things that we can do as an industry as well to try and, and encourage more young people to come into our industry. So yeah, we're, we would love it too. We're, we're, struggling to find that replacement workforce for our aging population of workers.
this trip that we call agriculture all the time in the innovation. And uh, people, it's typical that people at the, at the school summer, they will spend money on the stupid iPhone, but iPhone is not uh, that essential for us. So I think agriculture, but the other thing is, what the question? What can you learn from the adoption of agriculture about adoption of innovation? And secondly, I think a lot of time innovation is the issue of demographics. Do you see that there is a young, a young generation of people that are outside the industry, people that are young in the industry, maybe people that are working in farm workers and want to be in agriculture, many farm workers work there, that will really say, gosh, we will be the agent of change. Or do you think that the situation is such, gosh, bring it and then we mentor? Oh, part. Go ahead. Yep. I'll, I'll take a, a quick go at the second part. Um, this summer we had, uh, as part of the Ag AI or Ag Aid Institute uh, with WSU and several of the universities, um, we had an internship program, and I think we ended up with 17 interns. Um, several of those were all um, undergrads. Um, from different universities and from different types of studies. And, and um, what was interesting to me is that we tapped a few people on the shoulder to, to apply into um, the Ag Aid internship program that weren't necessarily headed toward working with agriculture. Um, maybe they had something lightly related around data science or biology or something along those lines. And the feedback that I generally saw from, we generally saw from folks, and this included at the high school level as well, is once, they, once it's experiential for them, and it's not just about working hard labor, it's, it's actually, boy, there are things you can do. There's computer vision things here. There's all sorts of really neat things you can do, coding. Um, on helping things be more efficient, efficiencies with business folk, um, they're, they're excited about. It. And so I think to Jeff's earlier point is it's, it's about helping, um, telling the story, evangelizing to the broad, that it's not just about all about hard labor and working your tail end off on there. It's here are some of the opportunities around this and here's why it's so critical that you get involved. So we're actually over time now, so I just want to thank the panel. I want to just take this a uh, quick chance to um, thank everyone, including uh, Robin Shane and H. Jacobs and the, the, um, the National Academies, uh, and also Chuck Rice for his help. Thanks to Douglas Jackson Smith for all the for all the help and support he gave. Uh, I want to say, thank WSU uh, for the support of this, uh, the support of the workshop, including Kirk Schultz and um, and uh, Chris Keen. Remember Chris Keen. Uh, and then and then finally, thank you to the to the WSU Tri Cities group, especially um, Aaron Brumbaugh, who supported all the. He's the chief information officer who supported the everything working on time and. Uh, I, I found this really uh, interesting. I learned a lot. I thought it was thought provoking to think about how we can have a more sustainable and equitable food system. And I hope, I hope we all uh, continue to think about these issues. So thank you everyone. Yeah, I'm going to